did we get some sort of did we get some sort of notification that this was starting? I didn't. The email said it would start at 9.30, and I think we were just all here at 9.30. All right, so let's, let's just get the meeting started, please. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Township of Georgian Bay Council meeting of Monday, November 8th. And I'd like to call this meeting to order at 9.45. And with that, an apology to everyone for and a great appreciation for your patience. Unfortunately, there are internet issues at the office that have now been, I believe, mostly resolved. Um, and so we're gonna try to go ahead with this meeting. Um, and again, thank you very much for your patience. And um, this meeting is now being called to order. In the spirit of reconciliation, we wish to acknowledge the enduring relationship between indigenous peoples and the territories they traditionally occupied. We recognize and deeply appreciate the historic connection they have to this place, the land, the water, the sky, and all that live on, in, and above it. We are grateful for the opportunity to meet here, and we thank all the generations of Indigenous peoples who have taken care of this place and who continue to care for it, and we want to show our respect. Hundreds of years after the first treaties were signed, they remain relevant today. May they guide our decisions and actions. We commit to learn, to educate, to honor sacred places, and to take action towards real truth and reconciliation. And this week being the week, a remembrance week leading up to, of course, November 11th on Thursday, when we remember all the, all our folks who, the people in the past who have fought for us and defended our country, I think we must also remember that many Indigenous and people of color uh, fought for us and many of them suffered as more than the rest of us and, and, and sometimes coming back and not being able to recognize, for instance, their indigenous um, heritage if they want to be recognized as uh, veterans. And so it, 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 that's also part of the long history that we should not forget and that we should learn from. This morning, we're going to start our meeting with a delegation uh, from Mr. Donnell of Donnell Law Group in regards to 10504 Georgian Bay Shore. And I'm wondering if the clerk could get the uh, individuals involved over onto our screen, please. Mr. Donnell is available, Your Worship. Good morning, Your Worship. And Good morning, Mr. Donnell. I understand you'd like to make a delegation to our council. Um, yes, I'm sure this is not something that's new to everyone. It's been discussed, I understand, for some time. Um, it really triggers um, concerns we have regarding the property. Um, would it be fair for me just to start where I think the issue is? Yes, please. So I understand that Aaron Berlis gave you an opinion in 2016, uh, which on fair read of it, has an interesting conundrum. On one hand, you can't rely on any um, sayings or any uh, warranties given by an employee of the company or by the, the town. On the other hand, they want to rely on them. So having said that, and not uh, poking fun at it all, but I'm saying as lawyers, we're always looking to best interpret the best we can. Um, I'd like to just talk about where we're at. My client purchased a property at a tax sale after due searches, talked to the clerk, talked to the planner, and was of the understanding that a road allowance could be made available. It was advertised as waterfront. The only way it would get to be waterfront would be a purchase from the town of some property they own. And even after the purchase, before she put her final monies down. So she made a deposit. There's a timeline, as you're all aware, that she had to make uh, a final payment. She then went and talked to the planner and the clerk again. 
to ensure that there wasn't going to be a problem. Now, it would be foolish for me uh, to think that nothing, anything's ever perfect. But there certainly were assurances that there were no foreseeable problems that would stand in the way of the purchase and or getting lake access. When it came time for the council meeting, as I understand, and, and fairly deliberated, please take no issue with what I'm saying about this. Um, it was put on hold because the diligence, due diligence then was done to make sure there was nothing from the MNR or anybody else where there could be an issue about giving the granting or selling this property so that my client could have lake access and purchase the property. It's on hold. And then there's a report back saying that it is important fish spawning and uh, heritage areas and should never be sold. Now, the thing that comes to mind in this, this is a secondary report and fair enough. It's contemporaneous with the sale but there was a previous report in anticipation of this matter that indicated this property could probably not be sold. Now, again, nothing's ever 100%. And when I say probably, there was a, what I'd like to say, a hold on any dealings with these properties suggesting that it would be wrong. And we would be foolish, all of us, to think that no one makes mistakes. The planner led my client to believe that uh, there would be no encumbrances, that it should be an easy move forward. And at the end, there was not only a hold, but a huge hold, a wall, if you would, that would stop council being able to grant uh, the sale of the property or the lake access. And this has gone on for some time. And even though the purchase was in 2000, let me double check my notes, 2014, and the Aird and Bearless letter was in 2016, there have been ongoing discussions and my client is mindful that nothing's ever a sure thing, but certainly there was, she was led to believe there was an expectation that it wasn't an absolute prohibition, which is what it ended up being. When you look at the, the way the land was designated just after her purchase and before council was asked to, to uh, sell the property to her, that there was an absolute prohibition. Uh, candidly, I can't see how you could work around it uh, as a council. I deal with lots of municipalities and uh, you were put in a position that you could no longer act upon this and couldn't sell a property fairly with a, a lot of effort and a lot of backlash. So my client's request is pretty simple. Give her her money back and take the property back because it's of use to no one. You can't get a building permit for it. It's landlocked. And it's not lakefront as it was advertised. And finally, when we're looking at the materials, and I'm not suggesting it has anything to do with uh, our problem, the person who gave her the assurances, the planner, is no longer with you. And I'm not saying that that bodes well or not well or had anything to do with this, but I'm saying there are a lot of loose ends and fairness with the greatest respect to, to you, Mr. Mayor and Council, fairness and equity would suggest that I sold something, even if I sold in good faith, but should have known or could have known that it was a problem. And the person purchases the property and they ask for their money back. It's not an unrealistic expectation. Now, my understanding further, and I know I'm on short leash, I'm looking up here, I've almost used my 10 minutes. Um, my understanding is that the, my client in frustration trying to make a point had not paid her taxes. I believe she paid them either Friday or has paid them this morning in the process of it. So the issue of whether or not she's in tax arrears herself now, uh, hopefully has been dealt with. I can tell you that's her plan because we talked about it at length on Thursday. What I'm looking for is equity and an understanding that there be a mistake was made, whether it be, uh, Let's, I have no doubt that it's unintentional, but the town staff should have known. The town staff shouldn't have made those assurances. And my client is bearing the brunt of the cost. Now, was it uh, an advantageous price? If it, had lakefront, if it had lakefront access, it was a very advantageous price. When it's basically an isolated piece of property she can't do anything with and can't get a building permit for, it's way overpriced. And all we're asking is to be put back in the position we were before we 
were misled about what the values were and what we could do with the property. Again, I'm not casting aspersions. Mistakes happen. But when mistakes happen, the people who make mistakes with the greatest respect should be the ones that help sort it out. My client shouldn't be the only one. I know it's an old, an old English term, the only one carrying the can. Subject to any questions, and, and I hope I've given them a fair blush. Mr. Donald, thank you very much for your overview. I appreciate it. Um, Council, is there any questions of Mr. Donald? Councilor Rianco. Can you just remind me what the value of the property was? You know, that's the one thing I didn't, I'm so interested in the, uh, in the, um, just one second. $77,631 plus HST. Could you repeat that, please? Sorry, yes, I apologize. Uh, $77,631 plus HST plus $292.74 for accumulated taxes up to the date of sale, plus land transfer tax of $412, um, $84 in title and document search, and seven fifty dollars in banking fees. Okay, thank you. Any other questions at this time? Councillor Jarvis. Just a quick refresher. Uh, what year was the uh, property purchased again? Uh, uh, thir uh, 14, sir. 2000, September 2014. Thank you. Councillor Jervis. Sorry, follow-up question. I, I, yeah, I presume property taxes have been paid uh, since, since since it was purchased by the sounds of what you just uh, told us. Yes, my understanding was that I talked to my client on Thursday. It came to my attention that there was tax arrears. And when I spoke to my client, and I'm not taking anything out of school, it was her form of uh, letting everyone know she was unhappy. And when I explained to her the consequences and how it was two different contracts, she quickly volunteered she would come and pay her taxes. She wanted to come to this meeting with a clean slate. Okay. So I presume um, she would be seeking uh, reimbursement of uh, any property taxes she's paid as well. In a perfect world, yes, sir. Thank you. All right. Um, just one, you know, all, all we're looking for, uh, Mr. Mayor, through you and council, is all we're looking for is to be made whole. Uh, no, I, I think that's been made very clear, and I think that council appreciates your um, your viewpoint, your perspective. Um, however, I think any discussion that we will have about this will end up being in, in closed session uh, due to the fact that it's it's a legal matter. Um, but we certainly appreciate your uh, your input and, and your, um, I'm going to call it your sense of fairness and understanding in this whole circumstance. Thank you. If there are any further questions and you need to email me, please feel free. I appreciate when people talk to lawyers, we're always, um, people are always put off. Um, but I'll tell you on a without prejudice basis, if there's materials you need, it's being recorded. If you ask or any further questions on a without prejudice basis, and I know everyone knows what that means, I am more than happy to respond. My client wishes to see a full and fulsome uh, presentation in front of council, including any questions you might have. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you, for letting, thank you for hearing me. Thank you. All right, council, does anyone wish to declare any pecuniary interests or conflict of conflict interests uh, or anything along those lines? I'm seeing none. I have something here. A motion and it says moved by Councillor Bocek, but I don't think we're going to do that given the, the circumstances. So I'm going to say moved by Councillor Jarvis, seconded by Councillor Douglas. Be it resolved that Council adopts the consent agenda of November 8th, 2021, as presented. 
Are there any concerns with the consent agenda, Council? Councilor Rianko. I, I downloaded the agenda on Saturday morning, I believe. And in my copy of the agenda, um, there were three sets of minutes that haven't been provided. So if they're out there now, I haven't read them. So I can't uh, support, or I can't approve a consent agenda without seeing these other agendas. They may be there now, but they weren't there Saturday morning. I would agree. I didn't see them by Saturday myself. I don't know if anybody else has, I don't know when they were posted. Mayor, can I speak? You may. Normally when there is a, an update to a package, we get an electronic update and I did not receive any electronic update. So my assumption is unless I get an electronic update, there are no changes to it. And I would say uh, in, in uh, support of Councillor Wienko that uh, we don't have the information in a reasonable time. We can't uh, deal with this matter. Ms. Way, um, actually, I, let's, given, given the circumstances, I, I would suggest that um, we should get, have more time. Were, were those minutes uh, posted at some point, Ms. Way? Uh, yes, sir. Posted on Sunday. I don't know why the notification did not go out. Why don't can, can we just defer the consent agenda until tomorrow and perhaps tack it on to our planning council meeting? That will give the uh, council a chance to review the minutes. And I'm, I'm thinking that might be appropriate. And we'll just take the whole consent agenda and uh, defer it until tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. I'll council. add an amendment, an addendum to tomorrow's agenda. Okay. Council, are you in agreement with that approach with regard to our consent agenda? I get thumbs up from everybody. And so let's, we'll, we'll, we'll consider that deferred until tomorrow, please. I think that's the most practical thing to do. All right, let's move on to our regular agenda. I've moved by Councillor Cooper, seconded by Councillor Hazelton. Be it resolved that Council adopts the October 12th, 2021. Whoop, sorry, I got the wrong one. I apologize to you. Okay. All right, there, now I have the right page. Apologies, apologies for that. Moved by Councilor Wienkel, seconded by Councilor Cooper. Be it resolved that Council adopts the regular agenda of November 8th, 2021 as circulated. Uh, Mayor? Councilor Hazelton. Um, I've been informed that item number 12 uh, has been uh, moved to uh, Tuesday in Planning Council when our lawyer is available. So my understanding is that that is not a topic for discussion today. Okay, I had not received that information. So item 12 will not be addressed today. I was informed of that by our CAO copied in uh, our clerk. So I'm just repeating what I received. Ms. That Gumby. is correct. That is correct, Your, uh, your Worship. I did email uh, Councillor Hazleton and the clerk just as a... Uh, just as an FYI that we would be doing it tomorrow and um, the agenda was not amended to reflect that. So it will be on tomorrow's closed session because we do have the lawyer already coming tomorrow so he can do both matters at the same time. So can I modify the resolution and say, adopt the agenda as amended to exclude item 12? Yes. Is that acceptable? Use the word deferred, but that's okay. Well, we're now remove, we're just yeah to remove item. Agenda. Okay, moved by Councillor Wienkel, second by Councillor Cooper. Be it resolved that Council adopts the regular agenda of November eighth, twenty twenty one, as amended to exclude item twelve. All those in favor, and that is carried. Thank you. All right. Let me sort through my pages here for a moment. So now we can move on to communications. And why don't we start with, uh, go in reverse order and say, we'll start with uh, Councillor Wienko, please. Uh, 
Uh, this has kind of been an average uh, month in the last little while. I had a couple of major uh, Zoom meetings, one with, with uh, the SSEA uh, quarterly uh, uh, meeting, board meeting, and uh, basically uh, um, a budget for this year is a little under budget because of the pandemic and so on. So that, that looks good for, for this year. The following day on the 26th, I had a um, um, Muskoka Watershed Executive Board meeting. Um, we haven't had one for quite a while, but anyway, we've had that one. And uh, so that was that was a couple hours. Uh, the following night on the 27th, um, I think uh, Councilor Bocek and the mayor and I attended the Six Mile Lake uh, uh, Cottage Association uh, Executive, uh, ex uh, sorry, annual AGM. And uh, a couple of resolutions that came up, they were trying to cancel fireworks uh, for our lake and uh, try to control uh, uh, boat uh, speed on our lake and uh, resolutions didn't go anywhere on that one. But there was a supporting resolution that uh, Six Mile Lake will form a committee to look at uh, internet uh, access on our lake. Uh, besides that, I had a couple of road issues, uh, one of them being uh, on the agenda this afternoon and it's hunting season in our area, so we got to keep out of the woods and uh, hopefully uh, the successful hunting season will end by ne end of next week. Thank you. Councilor Jarvis. Yeah, uh, the usual stuff for me, Committee of Adjustment, uh, Library Board, uh, SegBay, uh, we had an in-person SegBay meeting I had to clarify them since it was at Brissett House, which is municipal property, uh, on the contact on uh, COVID protocol, and we got that sorted out, and it went well. The meeting went quite well. It was nice to see everybody for a change in person. Um, so that was great. Um, and then we had uh, after Seg Bay. What I have after that? Um, we had that treaty. Uh, uh, lunch and learn session uh the last week and that went well it was very interesting uh uh process and uh learning session for me uh i i note that the williams treaties mr mayor seem to incorporate property up to the south end of our municipality but do that the the map that was shown did not was not in great detail it was a rather uh 10 000 foot sort of shot um, and I'm wondering if we are, in fact, subject to the treaty, the, the Williams treaties. I presume you confirmed that, but I thought it was interesting to see a big white spot, uh, which would mean no coverage by the Williams treaties, uh, certainly out uh, in, the, in the cottage community, um, which I thought was quite interesting. And I haven't sought clarification on that, but it would be interesting to hear more about it. Uh, and then uh, meeting also with our, our, our director of planning, uh, which I really appreciated doing. Uh, and uh, talks with um, constituents about the budgeting process. That's it. Thank you. Councillor Hazelton. Um, <clears throat> good morning and thank you for uh, the opportunity here. Um, the, uh, the month was uh, surprisingly busy. Um, uh, I uh, assume that most of us all had our one-on-one -on -one with uh, Chris uh, Aspilla, and uh, I found that to be very helpful. Um, as with uh, Councillor Jarvis, uh, talking about Indigenous training, I too found that Lunch and Learn to be uh, extremely informative, uh, but also very concerning. Um, but um, well, I followed up with a group that were uh, presenting the, uh, the training and uh, highlighted the similar concerns that uh, Councillor Jarvis just mentioned. And uh, what's important, I think, for us is there are a variety of other treaties that relate to our area uh, and domains of Indigenous communities that uh, are relevant in our area that weren't covered by that training. So I think the training was, was good and effective and helpful, um, but not perhaps quite as specific as it might have been uh, for our area anyways. Uh, the, the folks who ran it, the Cambium uh, Indigenous uh, group, uh, were good enough to send me some links to uh, the Indigenous uh, groups in our area that relate to our area in a similar manner to where the Williams treaties uh, covered the other areas south of us. So uh, I thought that was very effective. Um, I had many calls and emails with residents 
regarding some of the matters that are coming up on our um, Committee of the Whole agenda tomorrow, the, uh, the noise bylaw, the dark sky lighting uh, um, report, and uh, it certainly has stirred up uh, a lot of uh, visibility in our community because these are huge, huge problems in our community of Honey Harbor. And uh, we certainly uh, look forward to finding a way to make some uh, good forward progress on them. Um, had an opportunity to uh, speak more with uh, Mary Muter of the uh, George and Bay uh, Great Lakes Foundation. Um, and uh, not only was I able to uh, have just a, a brief chat with her about uh, a recent communique that she sent in that uh, helped us understand the leverage that we get when we work with that group. So, for example, we might spend 30000 but we're getting, you know, 80 plus thousand of value because of the involvement with universities and, uh, and others. Um, and she was very excited to tell me about a new um, a partnership that may be coming, that, which will bring even additional leverage to us without additional cost. So uh, when we get these doctoral students involved, um, it certainly uh, brings great value to our, our, our township and uh, I just wanted to share that. Um, and finally, I uh, got to enjoy the first snowfall of the season that actually stays in the ground. And uh, not sure I really enjoyed it staying in the ground, but uh, yeah, that was uh, the beginning of last week. So that's uh, an update from me. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cooper. Um, Councillor Douglas is before, I think. You're right. Uh, we did. A, we did a, I, I think we'll go Councillor Douglas then. What, what, okay. I'm it's looking at my list here, and I'm just throwing out the list alphabet. I have, and it's not quite in alphabetical order, so so corrected. I'm 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 so not offended. It's okay. We're all going to get there. <laughs> but thank you, Peter Cooper, for pointing. <laughs> well, for me, you know, guys, it's been um, a really busy month again this month with speaking directly with constituents in my area. Um, and I'm one thing I'm really finding interesting, and I, I would imagine a few of you others may also have noticed this, or maybe I'm just noticing a little bit more because we're an inland lake on, on Go Home Lake anyway, so for this particular area, is how many people are still coming to their cottages, which is uh, a little unusual. Usually we start seeing the marinas empty out and, you know, you see about 20% of boats still hanging around. In fact, it's quite a bit more, and I'll be interested to see as the weather progresses on how many more people people will continue to go through November and I'll let you know about that because it does show to me um, that over the years with all the you know construction that's gone on with turning these houses or cottages into four seasons or three seasons um, really where that's going and of course with the pandemic how many people are spending so much more time up north um, so and, and that impacts us in, in many ways of course and, I, and you all are aware of that so that that's been one interesting thing and I've had a lot of communication uh, being on a lot of docks um, just speaking with people in that regard. Another thing that, <clears throat> excuse me, that I've been, <coughs> excuse me, that I've been um, getting a lot of calls and I've had a lot of communication. It's not just this month; it's been past months. But in regards to communication with um, internet service, which is always a hot button for this township, uh, there is great concern with existing businesses on how to, you know, have business retention without fast internet speed. Um, and how to encourage new businesses, especially now that things are starting to open up. So um, quite a bit of concern in that regard again, and that has been ongoing and, and hopefully we're coming to some resolve with that and we'll get more news uh, for up in the MAC tier area anyways, where, where most of my calls are coming out of. Um, also, I've had a lot of communication from people over the short-term rental, which I know that'll come back on the board again, but just uh, I've had a lot of calls about that I guess, which is stemming from the report that came out a month ago or so. Um, just the difference between short-term rentals for people that own the buildings and short-term rentals for people that run them as a sole, solely as a business. So that's interesting and I'm sure that'll come back to us, but I've had quite, quite a few phone calls on that. And uh, other than that, it's just, you know, I'm looking forward to hopefully being able to attend the AGM meeting coming up in uh, MacTier at the MacTier Community Development committee, which is going to be the first one uh, in person. So we'll keep you posted next month on that one. That's it for me. All right, thank you. Um, I think Councillor Cooper, Cooper comes before Councillor Bocek, who I'm not even sure is here. So Councillor Cooper. 
Thank you, Mayor. And I'm not trying to uh, correct you on the alphabet, just ladies first. There we go. <laughs> and so um, just a uh, very busy month as well, uh, a lot going on. Um, I guess before I go through sort of some of the things that I was involved with, I'd just say that uh, I have been hearing quite a bit from constituents with respect to uh, lighting, night lighting, <laughs> uh, navigation, navigation hazards, uh, noise, noise bylaws, fireworks. Um, it's, um, boy, uh, short-term rentals. Um, and uh, Andrew, thank you, uh, Councillor Douglas, for, for identifying the, the distinction between sort of a corporately owned property and not. But I think the other issue that I've been hearing over and over again is short-term. In other words, less than a week is probably problematic. Um, so that might be another distinction for us to consider. But um, so busy just in taking a lot of uh, calls about a variety of different things. Um, but in terms of uh, actually what I was involved with uh, officially, uh, naturally the district council meetings are always there. But uh, in addition, I had a very nice uh, chat with Chris Aspala and uh, enjoyed uh, connecting with him and catching up and understanding where we're both coming from. Um, I, there were extra uh, district council meetings as well because of sort of budget considerations and consolidating some of the committees together. So we had lots going on there. Um, what else? So after that, uh, what have I got here? Um, sorry, just give me a second. Um, yeah, the other thing this, month i would mention that um aside from the lunch and learn uh on friday uh i would uh, mention that um, i attended a celebration for uh former premier uh, bill davis who's a quite a well-known resident of our community and uh interesting to see um a lot of uh, incredible number of uh, premiers and prime prime ministers including both current prime minister and premier speaking at this event. So it was kind of nice to see uh, the old days when uh, liberals and conservatives got along with each other. Um, not always happening in the world today, but uh, there was a more civilized world uh, uh, many years ago in the time of uh, Premier Davis. So uh, a very, very nice uh, event uh, held at Roy Thompson Hall. So I, I attended that and I think that's, uh, that's about it. So thank you. All right, thank you very much. And I say, Councillor Bocek, we know is enjoying a vacation and obviously wasn't able to sign in this morning. So we'll just have to assume that he hasn't been taking too many calls the past week to report to us. Um, for me, I had, I had a very busy month. Um, it started very pleasurably uh, uh, back um, about a month ago because I got to um, announce the winners of the school art contest with regards to the Honeybee Festival which I quite enjoyed. And I think the, the, the school quite did that. Unfortunately, it was all done by Zoom as opposed to live, but nonetheless, the reactions and, and, and the smiles definitely came through. So that was quite a pleasure. Um, and um, I had, I was you know, like already mentioned here, um, had a committee of adjustment meetings and planning discussion meetings. Um, one thing I did do, which I quite, um, it, I don't, I don't know if enjoy is the right word, but definitely in a sense of lots of education, I took some anti-racism training this past uh, uh, month, three different sessions, um, all organized through the, uh, the biosphere. And I, I, I found that uh, very interesting, um, very, um, I'm not sure what the right word is, but it, it gives you a definite pause for thought because there's so many things that we take for granted and we don't realize it um, the one thing that came up was something called the wheel of privilege, and depending upon which version you see, it could be ten, a dozen different factors, and you scale yourself in each of those factors as to where you are. Um, factors such as your gender, your sexuality, your skin color, your citizenship, your age, your education, your experience, the language you speak, uh, whether you're uh, you know indigenous. Um, your, your, your formal educated, all these things. And you're, I realized that on most of these scales, I was at the most privileged level or second most privileged level. And 
you you're just become very conscious of the fact that you can, you know, you all of us have had the opportunity of walking into a room and feeling a little uncomfortable because we didn't quite know it was a new group to us or a new situation. Well, imagine people who experience that all the time. And, and I think, you know, just it, it, it's, it's something that it, it, to say, it's given me a lot of pause for thought. Um, and I think that's something that we all should consider perhaps within the township level of doing some training along this line. I think it's very important. Um, I enjoyed on the 21st uh, that the Georgian Bay General Hospital had a virtual breakfast in which basically it was an hour long tour of parts of their hospital and, 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 and information about the hospital. I thought I found that very, very interesting and very enjoyable. Um, you know, totally unrelated, but the day after I went to a, a McLaren Art Center in Barrie, a 20th anniversary panel, I actually participated on it. But it's amazing when you do something like that and 20 years later and you realize how much has changed in 20 years and how much has not changed. And uh, you know, it's, it's good sometimes to get a longer term perspective on things as opposed to just the day to day or week to week that we're faced with most of the time. Um, on the 23rd of October, I, I attended the H2O um, conference being hosted by Georgian Bay Forever and Georgian Bay Association. It's the first of three um, um, about water levels and, 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 uh, and water related issues. And I found that to be quite informative and have full intention of attending the sessions they have. One is going to be in November and one in December. Um, 26, um, did the Indigenous Leadership Table. And it's always good to talk with that group of people and, and about how we're moving forward and trying to ever strengthen the relationship. Um, and uh, Lake Councillor Wayne already mentioned uh, the Six Mile Lake College Association AGM on the 27th. It was good to attend that uh, again by Zoom and listen to the various concerns and issues and discussion um, to get an understanding of some of the things going on over there. Um, on the 29th, Friday morning, the 29th, I was actually on the um, Thomas P. Coffin, the, the OPP boat, uh, as a guest of uh, Commander Joe Evans and piloted by Kent Anderson, who's been running that boat for the last, I think, 15 years or something like that. And we, we did a tour of the area. Um, I found it very informative what uh, Commander Evans is doing with the mayors within his area is um, meeting with them um, mostly in a cruiser. And I said, no, I think we should do it by boat. And so we did it. Um, and just to talk about what the issues that they face um, versus the issues that I've heard of or, or the concerns I have. And so it is, it is very good. You know, and they made the observation, as we all know, there's a lot of new boaters uh, on the waters the last couple of years. And it's surprising how many of them, if you will, don't have a clue. You know, they, they don't have life jackets. Um, they don't, they're not concerned about, I mean, they say some of them even, you know, say cheers to the OPP as they're going by with a beer in their hand. Like, I, and you just have to shake your head at some of these people. Um, and, and, you know, don't have a clue about the equipment, don't know really how, they're op how to operate the boat. Um, and you, it's, it's, it's a, it, they find it a, a quite disconcerting, uh, some of the things they've observed. Um, they can they can tell fairly readily whether it's somebody who's been running a boat all their life or brand new to it. And um, they they told me and very roughly they say about a third of their time is spent in education, about a third of their time is spent in enforcement, and they have zero tolerance tolerance for no life jackets or drinking on board. And uh, about a third of their time is answering calls for service, be they emergency calls of one form or another, or distress, uh, medical. Um, so, I mean, and that was a very rough estimation because obviously from day to day, it can vary terrific, uh, significantly. Um, enjoyed the uh, Land Trust uh, Basecapes art auction on the 30th. Um, and um, it was a, um, Again, again, electronic this year by, by Zoom, but uh, they were quite successful. And I'm afraid this year it cost me a bit of money, um, but there you go. Um, and um, also, it was 
attended one of those treaty seminars. Uh, and yes, uh, as both councillors Jarvis and Hazelin pointed out, you know, the Williams Treaty, uh, the way the people who are presenting it were talking about basically geography south of us. So it did include the what is was called the Bosley First Nation that, of course, was on Bosley Island and then moved to Christian Island. Um, and so that was part of the Williams Treaty as they were discussing it. But I, I agree, I've, I've seen maps that in, include the Williams Treaty going up to the French River and over to the Ottawa River. Uh, that was clearly more extensive an area than that they were directly speaking of. Um, and, um, but there are numerous treaties where, I, I, I love the one reference where they said it was covering, part of the Williams Treaty is covering a prior treaty that was the, the territory that from which you could hear a shotgun if it was fired on the coast of Lake Ontario. Now there's a geographical reference for you. That was a shotgun treaty, yeah. Yeah, the shotgun treaty. Uh, I, I thought that, I mean, I, I suppose it, it had a certain practicality to it, but uh, does that mean you're walking along the bush, can hear it, can hear it. Oh, no, I can't hear it. Okay, now we know where the boundary is. <laughs> but anyway, um, I think that's more than enough for me. Um, so I'm going to now pass it over to CEO Gunby. Good morning, everyone. Um, I don't have much to say other than everything that I took part in that's already been communicated to everyone. Uh, but the mayor and I have signed up for Roma, which is in January, and we're trying to determine uh, what ministers we're going to harass next year without sounding like broken records. So maybe we'll just fix up the words a little bit here and there. Um, with the short-term rental report that uh, Councillor Douglas brought up. Um, I have seen a few emails about that, but with staff turnover and everything, I'm thinking the earliest we can bring a fulsome report is January, just so the timeline expectations you're aware of. And that's all I have to say today. And, and, and just for everyone's information, the, the, with regards to Roma, absolutely one of our key topics that we're bringing up will be the, um, the, the floating cottages, um, and, and, of one form or other descriptions, and we're trying to figure out how many different ministers we can share this um, concern with. As many that will listen. And then some. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for that. Um, I think we now go on to staff reports. And the first report is from our CAO with regards to vaccination. Thank Excuse you, Your Worship. There is no report to this. It is just the draft policy that I wanted council to review. Uh, I am in council's hand when it comes to deciding if this is something they want to implement or not. Um, a lot of staff do, a lot of councillors do based on emails, conversations and things I've heard and, and seen. And um, my only concern with the vaccination policy is that while we don't plan on opening until at least January 3rd, uh, so it would come into effect January 3rd, if that is the day that we deem safe to reopen. I feel there may be a few changes legislated that we would have to implement into this policy. And I, if I remember correctly, if I read correctly, because there's still a lot of many different legislative changes coming out daily, that I think as of March 28th, vaccines are no longer, proof of vaccination is no longer required to enter any sort of establishment or building or anything. And so I'm just unsure if council wants this policy to be in place for two and a half months, um, if they're okay giving staff direction to have delegated authority to alter it, depending on the legislation that comes up. Um, I'm just going to leave this with council to discuss right now and vote if they would like this implemented when we do open the office. All right, uh, thank you very much. Can I just ask one question before I hand it over to council? Mm -hmm. And um, so th this is a policy you believe requires council um, support versus being just a, a, a normal or call it human resources pol <coughs> policy that you don't you don't normally bring to council. Correct. There's there's differences between um, what we clearly what we do and do not bring to council. Like an internal one, typically we would have it just staff taking care of it but with every other municipality taking this to council this is not something that anyone treats lightly no matter what side of the fence that you're on so this is something that uh, i definitely would need council support in order to pass. <clears throat> thank you councillor and is anyone wish to comment councillor cooper um thank you very much uh, mayor cuts here and uh, cao gunby um i did read through the policy um, but just for clarification, 
as of January the 3rd, I just want to understand, are we allowing employees to attend our buildings, let's say, offices, et cetera, without being fully vaccinated? I, I didn't quite understand where the hard line was or no hard line. Uh, as it's written right now, if you are not vaccinated, you would have to show human resources two negative rapid test results per week in order to access the building. If I may, Mayor, just to sort of go down that road. So we're s sort of following the same process that the district has put into place. Is that what I'm hearing? I am going to say that we're following about 85% of area municipalities with how they are handling this. Thank you. Councillor Wienko. Well, as I argued up at the district, uh, when they passed their policy, um, I argued that we had to have a mandatory uh, vaccination policy for all our staff. Um, I still believe that should happen in our township, that everyone who works for the township uh, needs to be fully vaccinated. Uh, I don't like the idea that we're going to have unvaccinated people because uh, although I do respect their position, it's a burden on our existing staff to ensure that these individuals do take their tests two or three times a week or whatever. It's like babysitting these people. If they haven't got the, if they haven't uh, uh, made up their minds now, it's, I think it's too late to for them, and I and I think we should have a fully mandatory vaccination policy. Uh, even though the province might say that uh, they don't have to uh, uh, be vaccinated in March, by March everybody would still be vaccinated. So I'm 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 not going to support uh, this particular policy unless it's fully mandatory that all employees uh, are vaccinated. Uh, and again, if if you want to say it by January third. I'm okay with that. Councillor Jarvis, followed by Councillor Hazelden, please. I find myself in agreement with Councillor Wienko on this. Um, I, I have deep concerns about uh, the, uh, the, the, the COVID uh, issues right now, and I'm even concerned that uh, provincial policy is looking at March for opening everything up. I don't even think that's a very good idea. So, um, I'm really happy to see that we're coming up with a vaccination policy, but I think it should be uh, mandatory. Thank you. Councillor Hazelton. <clears throat> thank you. Um, so I've read through your uh, report. Thank you. Uh, I would say from what I'm reading, I would support it uh, if you're looking for a council endorsement. Um, I do have a couple of questions, though. Um, you, you, there are going to be some people who have medical exemptions. Uh, what is the requirement for them to demonstrate that they are safe? I have another question after this, but could you please let me know what that? And if you don't, I, have, <laughs> if I don't you know if you want to answer, really that's really. okay too. I just, <laughs> um, I would assume they would still also have to have the negative PCR tests as not being vaccinated. Okay, so I'm not seeing that in here. Okay. Uh, ne necessarily. Well, I'm, I'm seeing it for those who don't want to get vaccinated, but um, if you have an exemption, um, I would hope that there still needs to be a requirement uh, to do that. And then secondly, um, one of the concerns that, that uh, I'm starting to hear out there is um, identification of certification or vaccination. So um, if I see somebody, if I'm physically in front of somebody and they have had a requirement to be vaccinated, then I will assume that they have been vaccinated. But if they aren't required to be vaccinated, they have a medical exemption or they have to do this biweekly test, then I think there needs to be some visual uh, identification of that 
because I may choose to not want to engage and, and work or, or interface with those people. Or if I don't have to wear a mask and I'm engaging with those people, then I want to be somehow told so I can wear a mask. In other words, um, it's one thing for people to say, I want to have this freedom to do what I want, whether it's medical exemption or personal exemption, but it's not fair to the rest of the population to not know what the status is of the person that we are interacting with. And so I think that um, if there if there is going to be a face to face engagement or uh, you know, human interaction taking place, that there needs to be some identification of the status of that person so that uh, those of us who are doing this engagement can take extra precaution ourselves because we don't necessarily trust those other measures. I'm just wondering what policies do you have or are you aware of or are they already in there that might provide that kind of protection for the call it the the normal resident who is attempting to interact with staff of the township but doesn't know what the staff status is and how do you how do you continue to be safe Ms. Gundy. uh yeah thank you through your worship as while i personally agree with that approach i think legally that is not possible we are not able to keep the record of who is vaccinated or not they have to show hr and we don't keep anything on file so we would not be able to um, have them wear a sign or a tag or have a you know a colored dot on their arm saying that they are or are not vaccinated so <laughs> so if they are in the office they are either vaccinated or they have shown us two negative rapid tests that week Ms. Douglas, do you care to comment on this matter? No obligation. Um, I'm, I'm of the opinion that the policy is fine, but I do agree with Councillor Hazelton that there, uh, it's a bit of a catch-22 situation because I understand what Jessica's saying here. You know, you really can't put a dot on people and, and advertise what you have and have not had done. That's violating a whole bunch of rules, I'm sure. Um, on the other hand, I do find it, for a lot of people that have taken the time to go and get the vaccination and that uh, firmly believe that that is what they should do, it, it does put them in an awkward position of not knowing, um, you know, whether you're being exposed. But I guess you could say that that's the same when they go out into the public. So I, it's a it's a tough one. I, I'm a little bit on the fence on this one on uh, whether, you know, we should be mandating people or not mandating people. I do still believe in freedom of choice. So yeah, I'm a little bit on the fence on this one, to be honest with you. That, that would be my comments at this point. I'm going to uh, take a turn and then I'll go to Councillor Cooper. But I, I have a couple of questions and thoughts. You, you have a human resources policy here. Um, when, when you are considering opening up the office, are you expecting anybody who comes into the office to, like a, a non-employee, a resident, for instance, are you expecting them to show proof of vaccination? No, at that time, we would still have the self-screening checklist that they would have to abide by and answer no to all of the questions before they were able to come in. I mean, I, I find it very interesting with all this, uh, I'm going to call it human rights angle, where we're not allowed to tell people to get vaccinated, we're not allowed to identify people, we're not allowed to put it in their records. And yet, I've attended a number of events recently where you had to show proof of vaccination to get into the event. And then you either wore a tag or you had an armband um, or simply you weren't allowed in. And, you know, and, and, and where they're, they're checking your identification, they're checking your, your, your uh, QR code, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm, and I'm finding it interesting because we're basically breaking down the world into two groups. And that is what there are two, two kinds of activities. And that is, I'll call it what they consider optional versus what they consider mandatory. And then optional, it seems quite acceptable that we can say to people, you have to show that you, you have to prove vaccination. And, and there are, of course, there, there, there are the, the, rare, the rare medical, genuine medical exemptions. Um, or you're not allowed in. But then when we get to other places, like many a workplace where they say, you know, you don't have to do any of this. And it seems to me rather inconsistent we, we know the, that the 
the, the virus is spread by um, airborne uh, in most cases, which includes conversation in relatively close proximity. Um, and, and therefore we, we would wanna know, I mean, uh, I just this morning read uh, in, the, in the States that they've done uh, numerous studies and they are now noting that the states that have higher vaccination rates have lower uh, rates of uh, infection. Like there's a direct correlation that they're now proving. And by the way, they're also showing that this is related to uh, political viewpoints as well, but that's a, that's a separate discussion. Um, but the, you know, we know that um, in most cases, the virus is being spread uh, by people who are not um, vaccinated. It is a risk. And uh, I know when we, we had this discussion at, at the district level, um, you know, there are a fair number of people who responded the following days with somewhat, in, in some cases, nasty remarks to counselors about stating that they think people should be vaccinated. But I think it's a health matter. I really do. And, and so I, I fully appreciate what Councillor Rianco was saying about, you know, we should consider mandatory vaccinations. Um, I, I know you did an informal poll amongst your employees at one point and the majority were vaccinated. I don't know what the exact figures were. Um, and I don't know what the stories were because I'm sure you didn't ask them because of human rights and all that about those who weren't. Um, but I, to me, it, it's a real concern. I mean, I, I think, yes, you should have a policy. I think the policy that you, you've presented um, probably keeps us on side uh, of the um, human rights issues that some people are, are bringing up. Uh, but I'm also quite concerned, as Councillor Hazelton pointed out, if we don't know whether the person we're dealing with is vaccinated or not, um, it, it, it affects our behavior. And I don't know how many times I've dealt with neighbors or residents in our area and almost the first thing ever amounts to it, I'm double vaccinated how about you oh I'm double vaccinated too okay let's that now we can talk or otherwise uh, otherwise the masks stay on and we and we try to keep some distance um and and I, I think it's it's unfortunate that what we are doing is we're not allowing that conversation that that I've had with numerous people in in the past couple of months with our employees, just because there's a very small number of people who don't want to be flagged as not being vaccinated. I know that's a bit of a perhaps rant without changing your policy, but I really, I wish your policy would say mandatory, mandatory vaccination and less of a genuine medical exemption. So now I'll go to Councillor Cooper, followed by Councillor Hazelton, please. Thank you, Mayor Kutzier, and I certainly concur with a lot of the thoughts that have gone around here, and it is a bit of a conundrum, but uh, I did not state where I stood on this, and I, I wanted to say, A, having attended an event at Bory Thompson Hall with maybe, a, I don't know, a thousand people, you couldn't get in unless you had a QR code fully vaccinated, period, and I wasn't going to go to an event like that unless it was that way, so I don't, I wouldn't want to be going into the township office unless I was comfortable that there was full and total uh, vaccination of not only our employees, but anybody visiting. So I'm, I'm with Paul, uh, Councillor Bianco and Jarvis in that I think uh, we need to have it, uh, let's not be too ambiguous. I found the district decision uh, a bit too um, ambiguous and so I think we we need to protect ourselves we need to protect our employees we need to protect our constituents thank you Councillor Hazelton I like this uh, identification idea that um, our mayor indicated he had to participate in and uh, uh, just thinking here out loud you know the idea of wearing a wristband for those uh, proud of the fact that they are fully double vaxxed um, you don't have to identify the people that aren't, but you can do it inversely by uh, allowing people to be proud of, of wearing it. And uh, you can essentially imply page 43 of our package, you've got a verification of truth statement uh, where anybody caught wearing a band that uh, was lying would essentially be violating that, uh, that fairly formal document, which uh, I, I'm assuming is a, 
is a, a, a witness and uh, uh, whatever the formal process is. Anyways, um, on, a, on another, another note related to this whole thing, you talk about January 3rd being a magic date. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, um, we seem to have, I think as a uh, province, experienced an uptick in uh, cases after group events. And we are going to have probably for us in Canada, the biggest group events of Christmas and New Year's uh, as being the two events prior to January 3rd. I guess uh, my concern is that that date I think is way too early. Um, I think we need a, a two week moratorium to find out which way the, the pendulum is swinging, so to speak, and decide two weeks later, are we in a massive uptick and do we need to be even more concerned than we are today? So I'm not sure that, and I don't know what um, abilities we have as, as a council to shift that date, but I think January 3rd is an inappropriate date based on, on massive, uh, intensive uh, socialization that takes place over the Christmas holidays. So just my opinion. Thank you. See you, Gandhi. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, thank you for pointing that out, Councillor Hazelton. I was trying to give uh, staff a, a good timeline and a, a good amount of warning when they would be expected to come back to the office. And I, I am not afraid to admit that I totally forgot about the whole two week after a large gathering thing. So uh, thank you for pointing that out. And we can definitely change that date. That was just a date that we came up with, um, but we can wait until after. As opposed, speaking about the wristbands you mentioned, I know that the health unit has been seeking a legal opinion about wristbands in general, mainly if you go to the same restaurant every Friday night and you have to show them your QR code and your ID every Friday night when you're there, they want to know if you could have a, a wristband to show like, no, I've already been here. You already have my things and I don't have to go through this again. So they're getting a legal opinion on that of having uh, proof that you have been vaccinated as opposed to proof you have not been vaccinated. So when that legal opinion comes back, I can definitely add something into the policy. Uh, something tells me that this is not getting approved today and I'll bring it back with some edits, either in December or January, depending. Um, and again, legislation may change and requirements may change between now and then. Thank you. Councillor Douglas, I think I saw your hand. No, but I, I, I will comment on that. I, I think it's, um, and it's a, it's a tough one. I my own personal feeling is vaccination is you know like this is uh, is going to help our population, but uh, I do have heard from many many people who especially young women who have not started families who have concerns that do not want to take that risk. So I think there are some exceptions. I I think this is a very hard issue and um it's a very good point brought up about you know extending the date forward uh due to the large gatherings but i look forward to sort of seeing what you come back with just with the um the amendments and and have another discussion on this and if i could just clarify sorry um just before I, i'm just taking notes here um did i hear that members of council want those all entering the building to show proof of vaccination whether they're coming in to pay their taxes or they're an employee okay I believe I saw Councillor Jarvis and Councillor Wanko's hands. Councilor yeah, I Jarvis. think Councillor Wanko had his hand up before me. Well, then we'll go to Councillor Wanko. Such a respectful council. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, no, I think you got to walk and talk. Yeah. If you, you know, I've lived my life in the last uh, uh, 20 months or whatever, um, concerned about uh, uh, the COVID situation. Um, when I'm out and about um, playing golf or whatever, if, if we have to be put with somebody, my first question is, are you vaccinated? I don't talk to anybody uh, unless I ask them how they're vaccinated. And if I'm going to go in, into the township office and we pass this particular policy, I'm going to ask them if, the, if, the, if they're vaccinated or not. I don't care what the human resources or whatever. I'm not going to interact with anybody that isn't vaccinated. And so I, I think to resolve all our issues, I think we have to have a mandatory uh, vaccination policy. We're a small group. Um, it shouldn't be that tough. Um, we need to get to our staff as soon as possible that we're going to have a mandatory policy so they can make their decisions on what their future wants to be in our, in our, our corporation. If they want a job next year or not. <laughs> 
Um, they've got to realize um, that um, they have a very good job working for the township. They have benefits and a very good salary and they have a livable income. And if they want to cash that all in uh, because of some personal feelings about not wanting to be vaccinated, so be it. Um, but they should be told as soon as possible that we're going to have a mandatory uh, policy. And I hope today that we would instruct uh, CAO to come back with a, a mandatory policy next month so we can proceed uh, accordingly. And it would be much more comfortable uh, next January, February, March, or whatever into next year to go in the office and know that all the employees are, uh, are vaccinated um, and that if we're going to be dealing with members of the public, we have the ability to ask them what their status is. So uh, for the last 20 months, I haven't talked to anybody that isn't uh, totally vaccinated. So why should I change now? Um, just because a corporation wants to have a different policy. So it resolves a lot of the concerns uh, that Councillor uh, Hazleton had about having a dot on your forehead or a, or a wristband. If everybody's mandatory, no, no, no problem. Let's move forward and uh, be one big happy family. Thank you, Councillor Jarvis. Yeah, I've I've been to a few events recently, uh, including movie theaters, and uh, my comfort zone is improved significantly no, knowing that at, at all those locations, the, uh, the the double vaccination and QR code was required uh, before entering, and uh, and on top of that, they not only ask for your QR code, but they also ask for further identification to compare with the QR code to make sure you are who you say you are, which is really, really important. So I, I'm feeling that these all these places, I'm thinking movie theaters and bars are to the come to mind right now can do this, we should be able to do it as well. On top of that, there are two things, free choice is well and good until it has a detrimental effect on other people. And then you've got complications and it's got to be considered in that context. And finally, uh, Ms. CEO, um, if, if, CAO, excuse me, CEO hey, would be good too, wouldn't it? <laughs> Um, if, if, if our policy comes down to what you've described in this, in, in this, um, document here, should you not also be allowing people to make the decision not to come to council or to the office if they are uncomfortable because there are people that are not vaccinated? Uh, thanks, Councillor Jarvis. So that is also one of the reasons I, I brought forward the hybrid work from home model a few okay. months ago when we do open. So because I know that some people, they still like working from home as opposed to the office or vice versa, but it also still allows those that may have a weakened immune system who don't feel comfortable knowing that there could be one or two people in the office not vaccinated, that they are still allowed to work from home. And also to clarify, um, I can state that I, I don't think this is brand new information for any of you, but even those vaccinated can still get sick and pass on COVID. Yes, can still be carriers, that's right. Mm -hmm. Well, now that um, Councilor Jarvis made the final remarks, um, CEO Gunby, um, do you, we're, we're obviously think, I think it's more or less consensus among this council that this the document presented is not final. Correct. Um, do you need anything from us at this point or have you got enough direction or what would you like from council? Well, the notes I have is that um, from what I've heard, the majority at least, uh, council wants all people in the building, buildings, whether they're employees or ratepayers to be vaccinated. Um, so does that include anyone taking part in recreation programs that we could be offering as well? I would say so. Okay. Just, I know, I think that's already covered, but just so I can cover it all in the policy. Um, so mandatory vaccinations for all staff. You want some sort of proof that people are vaccinated as opposed to not vaccinated as a wristband, for example. Um, and I'll, I'll check with the health unit on their legal opinion that they're gathering for that. And that you do not agree with our proposed January 3rd date, so we can move that, but I don't have to put that in the policy. I can just do an internal communication with staff about that. All right. Okay. And I so will bring it back. You don't need, uh, a, um, a resolution from us at this point. If you can just defer it. Okay. Then I can bring it back. And, and Councilor Douglas, did I see your hand? We did actually, I just, I, I think it's in there, Jessica, but I just want to um, 
I guess my concern is I do feel personally the same as the rest of the councillors by the sound of it that you know I'm, I have a much better comfort level knowing everyone is vaccinated. But what would what, what how do we accommodate for those who have health issues? It, I know there's something in the policy there. That, so they would give us their medical exemption, and yeah. that is something that we can keep on file. And so would those be the people that would end up working from home? Maybe is that they could or as long as the policy states that, well, even though it is mandatory vaccination, so if that comes back and the option to have just the two rapid test results a week is not even there, um, if, their, if their role enables them to work from home, then yes, I don't see why they wouldn't be able to. Yeah, because I think even, you know, if you have one or two people or three or whatever in the office that for medical reasons don't get vaccinated, mm -hmm. we're kind of back to square one with not everybody being vaccinated. So. <laughs> I mean, maybe that, that is something that should be looked at, that those who, for medical reasons, are not able to be vaccinated, that their role uh, hopefully allows them to work from home. Because I think, I think that that defeats the whole thing. If you've got one, two, five, whatever people that have medical reasons not to, they're still coming into that office and are, are exposed uh, to, you know, the people that are vaccinated are exposed to them. But just a thought, I, I'm not sure how you'd word that, but. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Rianco. I think it would be helpful to us um, that if by uh, when this comes back in uh, um, uh, December, can you do a, a, a poll of our staff to find out who is vaccinated and who is not vaccinated? We did that at the district and it was helpful to find out that there was I wouldn't say sizable, but there was enough unvaccinated people that that led to a change, uh, or at least a change in opinion of some of the councillors to go with this with their policy of uh, of having the unvaccinated uh, individuals being uh, tested uh, every forty eight hours. But if you did a, a poll of our staff, and there's like forty, forty five, or whatever. If there's only two or three people, it makes it a lot easier to make a decision. But if you came back and say like 25 out of the 45 are unvaccinated, then we have a problem. But if there's only two or three people, then we're wasting our time talking about this and we'll just go for mandatory because I'm sure those two or three will get vaccinated by, by September. So I think um, you should do a poll, including counselors and anybody else, um, and also our committees too. I think we have to look at our committees to find out who is vaccinated, who's not vaccinated, and bring those numbers back to us uh, in uh, December. Okay, we can do that. The poll that we did earlier, I think was at least two months ago. Uh, things have changed and uh, we can definitely send, set that out and then bring those results back as well. And we'll include the volunteer firefighters too. Thank you very much. I think we I think we've discussed this fairly fully, and uh, I got enough, enough heads that I believe we all agree that we'll defer this and have a a modified version to look at uh, a month from now. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next on our list, the third quarter variance report from our financial services department. Ms. Boutiet, I believe that is you. Through your worship. Thank you for having uh, me this afternoon and having read the report. Uh, it is our quarterly report, which usually goes into consent. Uh, there is one matter that needs approval today, so it was not put in the consent agenda. Uh, and that is an item that was mentioned at our preliminary budget meeting that uh, there was an error in budget for PIL taxation revenue. PIL, I remind you, is payment in year of taxes. Um, so we uh, should everything go as budgeted, which we know it doesn't. Uh, we may need to pull from reserves to fund that error. Um, and we made sure that the 2022 budget does not contain that error. Um, so it is before you for approval today. Okay. But because it has been pulled, pulled from the consent agenda, we'll go to council and say, is there any other questions that council may have in regard to these uh, Variance report. I'm not seeing any, 
So with that, I have moved by Councillor Jarvis, seconded by Councillor Hazelton. Be it resolved that Council receive the third quarter variance report for the period ending September 30th, 2021, and that the overstatement in taxation revenue be funded through the working reserves if required. All those in favor. And that was carried. Thank you. If we do all the rest of our items as quickly as this, we can enjoy the good weather this afternoon, not being in council. But I know that's getting way ahead of myself. We have now from operations, and I see Mr. Sokash, a report on Fragmites. Mr. Sokash. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, this is in response to a resolution from May earlier this year from council um, requesting a policy on Fragmites on the roadside. So we've put one together for the operations department. There are three parts. There's identification. The second part is eradication. Eradication, and the third part is uh, the cleaning of municipal equipment. So, with respect to identification and mapping, what we're proposing is to have uh, a yearly session with our staff to ensure they're able to identify Phragmites, as well as requiring them to have the uh, the mapping app on their phone so that they can um, track, so that we can track where the Phragmites is. Secondly, is the erratic eradication, um, which will involve selective cutting uh, as long if there are small numbers of plants. Uh, herbicide applica application, as well as budget for the herbicide, and if needed, some interim mechanical cutting. And finally, uh, with respect to cleaning municipal equipment, if we're doing work in an area where the Phragmites has been identified, we're proposing to assemble a portable trailer that can be used to wash off the equipment on site to reduce the amount of tracking of the seeds throughout the municipality. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Council, any questions of Mr. Sokash in regard to this policy? Councilor Wienko. Well, I'm glad to see this policy coming forward. I, I think, uh, uh, Brad, I think you already know pretty well where all these small stands are. Um, as you know, the district have done, and uh, they've been working throughout the whole district, and they've done a good job in, in getting rid of the frag Midas on their right of ways so or their roads. Um, I, I'm not aware that we have a lot on our roads um, in, in our township. Um, there is some close to the water, and I think I sent you something last week about uh, Port Seven Park, um, and uh, so they'll have to be done by uh, by mechanical or by hand or whatever to get rid of those stands. But uh, um, if if a staff is going to be trained on identification of phagmitis and so on, it might be worthwhile having a session with SSEA and their invasive species coordinator about other invasive species that might be in our township. Obviously the giant hogweed is one of them and there's a few other one Asian, can't remember what they are, but there's a number of uh, uh, type of uh, plants that are invasive in our township. And it would be nice to have staff trained on identifying that too. And if necessary, we can get into control program on those other ones too. So I got a phone call with the SSEA, maybe a training program uh, with the invasive species individual. Uh, and they may not even need a training program because they have a, they already have a, a bunch of overheads anyway. So, uh, but it's something worth looking into. Thank you. Councillor Jarvis. Question for you, Brad. Um, I think it was two falls back. On my way at the Honey Harbor Road, I saw somebody spraying what appeared to be uh, Phragmites. So I stopped and talked to the individual, and sure enough, that's what they were doing. It was a test patch to see if the herbicide indeed worked, uh, and there there were requirements they indicated to me with regards to how close to a wetland and stuff like that they could be doing it. Uh, are we, I think this may have been a district initiative since it's a district road. Uh, are you aware of, of that take, having taken place? Through the mayor, that doesn't ring a bell with me. 
Uh, we've done some spraying on our property and our roads, but I don't recall uh, being advised to district spraying on Honey Harbor Road. Okay, it was out towards where that uh, Bell uh, Bell building is. Um, interesting. I think it, uh, I'm agreeing with uh, Councillor Rianco that the SSEA should be used as a resource in this. I'm thinking the G, uh, the Biosphere Reserve has done an awful lot of work as well, so they should be a resource. Dog strangling vine is the other one that comes to mind for me, uh, Councillor Rianco. Um, on different invasives, you might as well get a, the whole gamut uh, uh, covered while you're doing the one on Phragmites. And uh, obviously, in light of what I saw on a district road, I think it might, uh, obviously, I'm sure you're in touch with district anyway, but just a reminder, the district probably would be a good resource as well. Anyway, I liked, I liked seeing this on the, on the books. Thank you. I have a question for our clerk, and that is in the resolution in front of me, um, you have the policy number with a couple of X's in it. And I don't know if you have a, a number for me. Um, because of our computer system issues, I wasn't able to get a number. Um, I don't know if this is the first policy operations has passed this year or not. Perhaps Brad would know that better, but that was the number I was looking to insert in there. It doesn't need it. We can pass the policy, like we can pass the resolution without it. It's just okay. Five years from now, it's helpful. That's all. What I have is moved by Councillor Hazelton, second by Councillor Douglas. Be it resolved that Council adopts the Pragmatis policy and that Council authorizes an allowance of ten thousand dollars to be included in the twenty twenty two operating budget and sub subsequent years to apply herbicides to Pragmatis if required which may result in a tax increase of 0.3%. Any further discussion? Councillor Cooper. Just thank you, Mayor. Very briefly, uh, Brad, um, I think it's Georgian Bay Forever that's uh, where you would get um, information on Phragmites. And uh, aside from SSEA, they've been working on it for years. So um, just uh, might be helpful to you. Thank you. Thank you. All those in favor? And that is carried, thank you. And there's one more for Mr. Sokash, I believe, and that's in regards to uh, snow storage at Oak Bay. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, as you noted, this is with respect to snow storage in the Oak Bay subdivision, both the part that's assumed by the municipality as well as uh, part of the condo, there are difficulties with snow storage due to the narrow roads and the design of the subdivision. We've taken over Lynx Trail and Masters Court. This will be our first winter with it. Um, we need to find somewhere to store the snow when we move it as there aren't areas identified on site for this. So we're proposing to put it at the end of Leduc Lane. As well, we've been approached by the condo corporation who are having a similar problem with snow and snow storage and they've requested permission to place the snow at the end of Leduc Lane as well. There is a caveat um, that I'd added with them that if we run into, whether it's snow storage issues or any other problem that we can cut them off from moving their snow there. But in the interim, um, it's something that we're proposing to try this winter and looking for a council's input on whether they agree with the Cotton Oak Corporation also using it. Just to clarify, if you looked at the map, it seems to suggest that you can come right off of Golf Course Road to the to the uh, roundabout on Leduc Lane. That is blocked off. We may or may not open it up, but if we can't open it up, then the uh, trucks will have to haul the snow onto Honey Harbor Road, down Community Center Road, and then on to Leduc Lane. Thank you. All right, thank you. Councilor Yanko. After reading the report, I wasn't quite clear. Um, is this all the, the costs associated with this is totally recoverable from the uh, uh, Oak Bay Condominium Association or whatever? Like this is not something additional in our, in our budget. This is all being funded by them? Through the mayor, we are not doing any of the work for them. We're not hauling any of the snow. Um, the little 
incremental cost that could occur would be pushing back the snow in the in the roundabout but we'll have to do that for ourselves for the material from master's court and lynx trail so um we don't anticipate any significant costs coming from this oh so you're saying that uh, they're, they're doing the work of uh, they're contracting the work and they're stowing it on our property through okay. the mayor that is um, correct okay on the marine uh was a marine drive the marine uh, marine townhouses i thought they had a big parking lot uh, down by the marina that they were going to use for snow storage is that not uh, applicable to them it's a lot closer to them and keeps it off our property through the mayor uh i believe it's under construction right now and secondly i believe that area is identified for snow storage for the new condo areas and not for this area um it's broken into different condos as I understand it. And the new ones that are, are possibly under construction, I haven't been down there for a while. Uh, part of that area is to be used for their snow storage, but it doesn't include Marina Village. We are hoping to work out something with the developer at some point so that uh, the Marina Village people aren't having to put snow on the township snow storage area. But for the time being, um, this seems like a reasonable compromise. Any other questions? Councilor Jarvis. Only that I prefer this to having the, the snow dumped in the lake. Um, and I, I, I refresh my memory, Brad. Obviously, when we take over roads within a community, snow storage is obviously one of the considerations we got to come up with. And I know that we've recently taken over responsibility for some of the roads in Oak Bay. Is this part of that? If we were only looking at the snow storage in the two portions of the road that we took over, it probably wouldn't have come to council. We would have just done this. Okay. But because the condo corporation is also looking for a location, that's why we've brought it to council. I understand. Okay. Thank you. The resolution reads, moved by Councillor Douglas, second by Councillor Cooper, be it resolved that Council directs staff to enter into a one-year agreement for the storage of excess snow from the roadway within the condominium corporation responsible for Oak Bay Marina Woodlands, Marina Towns Development, and that the area for snow storage be at the end of Leduc Lane. All those in favor? And that is carried. Thank you. Now, so normally I go for a, a coffee break around now, but I figure because we've uh, had a late start that we might as well go through the rest of the staff reports. Uh, everybody's in agreement with that? Okay, we'll keep carrying on. So Ms. Schneier, I believe you're up for a couple of reports. And the first one being on the Brissett House Market Review. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I think Trish is was going to speak to the first report, no. but I don't actually see her outside of the gallery. Can somebody let her in? Yeah, please. There, she's there. This is actually Trish's report, so I'll let her take the lead and I'll support her if need be. Okay, thank you. Ms. Walden. Good morning, Your Honor. Morning. So would you like me to continue through you? I would, I would like you to present the Brissette House Market Review Overview, please. Perfect. Okay, through you, Your Worship. We held the market starting May 25th this year. Uh, we saw an average of seven vendors attend weekly, but we did have some weeks that were higher, seeing upwards of 10 to 12, especially if we had like nonprofit organizations join us, such as uh, the Georgia Bay Biosphere, Georgia Bay Land Trust were there. We also had visitors from Fire and Bylaw from our own department. So that was really nice to see them out there. We had guest vendors, including Georgian Bay Spirits. Um, they came out and gave out free free drinks, which was good. 
Um, there were lots of things that were learned over this process. We had 150 patrons attend each week after July 1st. So that was the height of the season. Um, and we're just looking now to make sure we can continue on with this market for next year as the pilot project we staff saw it as a success um, and that we discuss, you know, the vendor fees that came in and uh, how to proceed with the future. Still muted. Okay, thank you very much for that. Appreciate it. Um, I know I attended the market a number of times and quite enjoyed it and uh, even got a free coffee out of it a couple of times. Um, so that was very nice. Um, Council, any questions? Councilor Cooper. Thank you, Trish. And um, I'm, I'm delighted that you're seeing some success. I just had a, a very brief question, and that is, um, you know, in terms of uh, vendors and wanting to be involved with something like this, the proof is in the pudding. Uh, and the meaning, uh, if they made money, they're going to come back. And that was the case. Is that correct? We had enough traffic that that there was uh, an opportunity for all the vendors to make some enough money to to cover their expenses and make a profit. Thank you. Through you, Your Worship, uh, to Councillor Cooper. Yes. So I surveyed all the vendors that attended, and they got back to us. Everybody wants it to return again for next year. So out of the seven consistent vendors, all seven of them definitely responded. Yes, we'll do it. Out of new vendors and guest vendors, they were like, yes, sign us up. We did a great job. They made money. They made connections. You know, we did have, we had the Muskoka chef there and there were some weeks she was unable to attend, but that's because she was getting more business. So this market, whether she got it through the market or got it because there was more advertising for her business or however she got it, her business was growing. And that was the purpose of this market. All right. Any other comments? Councilor Rianco. Uh, just two questions. Um, on an on a average week, uh, how much time in maybe FTEs or whatever do you spend on organizing this? this you know, I just want to get an idea how much staff time is involved uh, in, in organizing this on a weekly basis. That's my first question. And my second question is, a bit off track, but I wouldn't mind getting an update on the uh, the holiday market that's being proposed. Through you, your worship, to Councillor Rianco. Uh, thank you for your questions. So, I would say approximately. I did spend Tuesdays. I was there at the market. I was able to set up using. You know, we have the Rogers Hub. Uh, for internet service and I did set up and was able to work and keep track of the numbers uh, an idea of sustainability Jennifer Schneider is that maybe we could uh, put this out for a summer student to manage the markets and you know the potential of maybe opening up a different market and having them manage that with me overseeing it if I proceed in this role uh, as for the holiday market, unfortunately, I, it's been difficult to get vendors. I've had a couple of come forward, but not enough to go forward with it. So that email is going out later today to say that, unfortunately, we weren't able to proceed with the holiday market. Okay. Any other comments? Councilor Jarvis. Yeah, you may have partially answered my question, Trish. Uh, it was to do with uh, internet Wi-Fi service. <clears throat> and I do know that uh, the vendors there do operate on, a, obviously have some connection. Um, and in my conversations with SegBay and, and uh, over the last two meetings, um, <clears throat> I've been told that the uh, internet access at the Preset House is absolutely horrendous. And I was trying to tie the two together, but now you tell me you got a Rogers hub you set up for the uh, market specifically. So that would be outside of any uh, general Wi-Fi signal we might be able to provide via our link with the Preset House there. And I, I don't know what the benefits could be, would be. Is it Would it be better to try and just get better Wi-Fi for the Preset and the surrounding area as opposed to bringing in a, a Rogers hub every time we need it? 
Um, I'm just wondering if that's uh, anything for consideration, N not just for you, but that might be in Brad's department as well. Yes, through you, your worship too, mm -hmm. Councillor Jarvis. I did not share the passcode or the password for the vendors to use the hub. I just utilized it myself for work that needed to be completed. They were unable to tap into the Wi-Fi that's available at SegBay or even the library could not get a connection to them that way. Most of them did use, um, if they needed to use that for their payment processing or anything, they used the data that they had on their phone. Okay. They tethered and, up, okay. Yeah, it would be great. I agree with you. It would be a great idea to have that available and I think useful for vendors. Yeah, if we could just keep that in mind through you, uh, uh, Jennifer, and even with Brad. Again, Seg Bay has issues uh, just at the at the Brissette House, so the Wi-Fi kind of stinks. So just generally speaking in that area, it would be nice to have some sort of upgrade from somebody. Ms. Schneier, did you appear because you have a comment to make? I know your worship. I was just here. I'm just here to support Trish. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? The resolution I have is moved by Councillor Cooper, seconded by Councillor Jarvis, because Bocek isn't here. Be it resolved that Council directs staff to continue to pursue the Brissette House Market in 2022 in accordance to standards set by the Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit. And that staff be permitted to waive fees up to $250 per vendor should the vendor be a not-for-profit agency. And that staff be permitted to waive 50% of fees to a maximum of $125 per season for a first year startup or a business that cannot meet the required vending fee as a result of COVID-19 related circumstances to be determined at the discretion of the Director of Sustainability on a case-by-case -case basis. And that Council acknowledges that some fees were waived in 2021. Councillor Hazelton. So <clears throat> generally, I don't have a problem with the, the resolution, but I, I don't think we're seeing is a uh, financial accountability for this project. And we, I heard another councillor ask uh, Trish about uh, her time involved and subsequently the cost. I, I think it would be helpful uh, for us um, on council to understand the big picture here. What is it costing uh, the township for this? Um, I see that we're waiving fees up to 250 bucks uh, or 125 bucks or altogether. Um, and what we are not seeing is what are our taxpayers funding for this? And I'm not suggesting it's not something we don't want to fund. Uh, it's just that in the interest of transparency, I think that we need to have a complete transparent cost uh, and uh, cost recovery uh, um, report so that we can be making uh, informed decisions as opposed to just simply, well, it sounds like a good idea, so let's keep doing it. Thank you. Ms. Walton. Just through you, uh, your worship to Councillor Hazelton. Uh, so I spent probably, you know, two hours a week on the market itself, like just concentrating on that. We spent zero dollars in marketing. I used all of you know social media. That was the only marketing we did. We did not do any signs. I home created some signs and you know went that way. Now that there will be less time next year setting it up, especially because it won't be a first year, it'll be something that's already been done. So the forms are already created. Uh, we have a process now that's installed. And so it's less time. And we did create, like we did make a revenue of $650. And when the original report was brought to council, it was not the intent to make money for the township, but to help spur business, especially going through such a tough time as COVID. Thank you. Any other questions or discussion? I've already read the uh, resolution. So I'm gonna call all those in favor. And that has passed. Thank you. That is carried. And we have one more sustainability report, and this is regard to the MacTier Community Garden. Ms. Schneier. Oh, thank you, Your Worship. Councillor Douglas, I know you'll be pleased with this report. This is to highlight an opportunity for the community of MacTier 
to create community gardens that you see at, similar to what you see outside the municipal office here in Port Severn. Uh, there's three resolutions in front of you, of course, to move forward to this by committing some staff time and then also uh, being able to work with the biosphere to facilitate a garden and then also to create an MOU with the biosphere that at the end of the life cycle of the garden that they will uh, participate in removing any uh, infrastructure that's on the uh, municipal owned land uh, right now. So we have provided you with a map so that you can see that this uh, land that we're talking about is at the corner of Joseph and Center Street, it's municipal owned and is a good location. We've checked with Brad uh, with respect to anything that we would need to do for permitting. And uh, we are in a good space to be able to offer our community garden on that location. And I bring this forward to you today for consideration. Thank you very much. Um, and before I lead the discussion, um, just as a point of observation, I am a member of the biosphere and therefore in an abundance of caution, I will be not adding comments or voting on this matter. Um, Councillor Douglas followed by Councillor Jarvis. Thank you. And Jennifer, thank you so very much for all the work that you've done on this. Uh, this is something that this community has been looking forward to, I think, for a number of years. I mean, this was brought up in my first term of council. Uh, we tried to do a little something at the side of the arena for the kids at the school. Um, and since that time, you know, this has been, as I said, an ongoing process to, to try and get it there. And uh, I really greatly appreciate it. And I can tell you from the community as well, the work that's been put into it and the fact that this is a, a true possibility now to go forward. Um, I'd like to be able to, you know, I've offered many times to be able to try and help in any way I can to get that process going, but you've got that well under hand, but should you require my help any further down the road here with this one, uh, do let me know as far as volunteers and so on go, should we, should we get moving on it? But I, I do wanna thank everyone that's been involved with that because it's a, it's a great thing to have in a community, especially now. Hey, Councillor Jarvis. Yeah, just a, a clarification for me, I, and I think it's a great idea as well. I have no objections to it. Um, I just being uh, having been in Mac here just a few times in my life so far. I'm just curious to know where that location is relative to what I would call downtown, where the grocery store is. Can you can you just sort of line me up and where that is relating to all that? Uh, Councillor Douglas, uh, through you, Your Worship, Councillor Douglas, do you want to answer that one with respect to how? It how close it is. I'm not familiar in terms of blocks. I, I can I can tell you it's it's about one block over from uh, High Street and off of High Street is the main street. So it's roughly a block, block and a half. It's definitely within walking distance for most. Um, I think it's in a great location, you know, because it's uh, it, I mean, to me, it would have been ideal to have it right at the library, but of course, that's not always really feasible <laughs> for a lot of reasons, but it is fairly central. It is only the one block away, in my opinion. When I look at the map, I, I'm, it's not that far to walk. Um, I think it's a great location. It looks like it's a fairly good sized plot of land to get started. Does, with, yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Yep. Councilor Rianco, I believe I saw your hand. Well, somewhat related to that question, um, this is, is not necessarily out in the open. It's kind of an isolated spot on uh, Center Street. And I'm just wondering, um, being kind of in the subdivision, I guess, uh, is there any concerns about vandalism or whatever might happen to these, uh, these uh, plots, uh, did we, we have any problems with the one at the township office? I, I know that's fairly visible, so you, it's really hard to do any vandalism there, but I'm just wondering if this is kind of on a back street and I'm just concerned that uh, uh, there might be some vandalism associated with this. Um, any thoughts on that? After your worship, Councillor Wanko, there was no vandalism uh, or theft or uh, anything that had gone awry in the Port Severn location. It might be beneficial if the residents can keep an eye on the garden. There tends to be a little bit of pride of ownership for a project like this. And I suspect that uh, we will have more eyes on it uh, where it's located than we would if it was by the library where perhaps there's less residents uh, and less hours of uh, eyes that are on it. Councillor Douglas. 
Sorry, just I, just in terms of that, uh, did I see somewhere in that report something about fencing or? I'm not sure. Did I? I'm, I thought I read something about there being fencing available or or a, a possibility of fencing. Oh, that's you were, sorry. Sorry. Dan. That's a yes to fencing, but it wasn't to keep the the teenagers or no. the vandals out. It's to keep the deer out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was going to say, as far as vandalism go, that that would be my hope that the only vandalism would actually come from the wildlife because yeah. Um, the other, I had another question for you and I'm just, just trying to think, uh, the neighbors, have we heard anything from the neighbors in that area uh, in regards to, do they get notified of this or once we've made a decision? Uh, we can notify them. That would be a good idea for, uh, for ownership of the project and also to solicit some volunteers that are nice and local. So I think that's a good next step. Uh, but we, let's get some direction from council and we'll, uh, I'll let you uh, feel comfortable knowing that we will do that uh, with the direct neighbors uh, and then proceed uh, beyond that. Okay, great. Thank you for that, Jennifer. Um, any other comments? I have moved by Councillor Douglas, seconded by Councillor Rianko, be it resolved that the mayor and council direct staff to work with the Georgian Bay Biosphere to ensure that all applications, permits, and approvals are in place for a community garden to be located at the corner of Joseph and Center Street in Mac Tier. And that the mayor and council direct staff to work with the Georgian Bay Biosphere to facilitate a community garden for the residents of Mac Tier and surrounding area. And that the mayor and council direct staff develop a memor memorandum of understanding with the Georgian Bay Biosphere on how the property needs to be decommissioned if the funding is no longer available. All those in favor. And that is carried with five votes. In Thank favor. you, Richard. Thank you. Okay, I get to flip over on the agenda to the next page. Um, draft calendar from our clerk, Ms. Way. Mm -hmm. You presented us lots of pages with colors, I believe. I did. I liked lots of color. Um, this came forward at the last meeting and upon review and discussion with staff who are responsible for the committees and a review of our calendars, um, counting back the days that agendas need to be prepped for, as well as including the district schedule, there isn't alternatives for these dates at this point in time. So this is still the same version as last month, um, but staff are still recommending the same uh, SMT had quite the debate about the calendar and tried to come up with further options, um, but this is still the best the, the best version that we can come up with was spacing things out appropriately, having um, enough time to do agendas and not interfering with the district's meeting schedule. So there was obviously a reason that these were the dates um, previously um, that we're carrying forward with, so. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Council, any questions or comments? Councillor Hazelton. Thank you. Um, so I, I heard what our clerk just said. Um, however, in our last meeting, we did agree that uh, the staff were going to reach out to the planning committee and do a poll on what dates of the uh, days of the week were available dates that could be met. And um, uh, I think that um, given the the profile of uh, the members of the planning committee, um, I think that we should be finding a way to try to accommodate their schedule as opposed to tell them take take it or leave it. Um, and this is the only day that we can meet. And uh, so I'm I'm uh, a little concerned that uh, the direction we'd provided hasn't been followed. Certainly, as a planning committee member, uh, I was never polled, and I have no idea whether this date works. And this all could be useless uh, verbal dialogue because maybe everybody can meet. But um, I think that it's um, uh, it's our duty to reach out to this planning committee of uh, very senior people to find out uh, if, in fact, uh, Friday is a date in which they can meet. Thank you. Worship, Please. 
um, that was noted. And like I stated previously, it has to do with staff schedule, our ability to accommodate agendas. I do understand that there are members of the public involved, um, but historically, not just for Georgian Bay, but other municipalities all across Ontario, generally the municipality dictates the schedule um, based off of a multitude of, of factors, right? It's not just about what the committee members' availabilities are. I'm not saying that's not important. I'm just saying there's other factors involved um, and moving one committee creates a domino effect. Councillor, excuse me, Councillor Hazel, uh, sorry, Councillor Cooper. Uh, thank you and thank you, Karen, for that clarification. Um, however, I have to say that I concur with uh, Councillor Hazelton's comments about uh, consulting with uh, uh, really quite a, a number of very good people that we have on this committee. Um, and uh, I would like to make sure that we're not, uh, um, that we help facilitate uh, their attendance. And uh, so I would encourage that. And I think that was the direction we discussed previously. The other point I'd make is that I see that the committee is showing up as of September 2022, but not into the fall uh, period. Uh, so there's a period of about uh, three months without any meeting. And then all the other months, it's every month. So um, right. that's because something? of the election. Okay. It, it's it, that's because the election, it, it's it's the way the staffing falls. This happens every year when there's an election year. There isn't committee meetings between October, November, and December. And it's not just here. That's everywhere. We can't facilitate committee meetings in those months in an election year. Ms. Gondi. Hi, and I just wanted to verify also, or sorry, clarify that uh, the planning committee and all committees are with the terms of council. So we wouldn't have any meetings if the next council decides not to have this committee, we're not gonna bother scheduling them. Thank you very much for the clarification. I would still like to suggest that we need to canvas our very fine committee members on the planning committee. Thank you. Councillor Rienkel followed by Councillor Jarvis. <laughs> um, on the planning committee, I see some of them you have on uh, district weeks and sometimes they aren't on district weeks. Um, is the rationale for that? Let's say I wouldn't mind having it on district weeks, but it's just my personal because I it allows me to do all my meetings in one week. But uh, you have a bit of a mix of both. Is is the reason for that? It's how the weeks fall. So let me come out and find an example. Uh, every time that the last Friday of the month is in district week, planning mm -hmm. committee is on. District week and every time Friday, there's a last Friday that's a week later, they have it a week later. Huh? I did the math. Planning, planning committee is scheduled for the last Friday of every month. Sometimes that is the third week of the month, the third. So planning committee falls currently according to the schedule on the last Friday of every month. District week is the third week of every month, and sometimes the last Friday and the third week overlap. Okay, so why can't planning be on the third week of every month? I, I just can't figure that one out. I don't, I don't know why you chose the last Friday of the month, but let's say I have to get all my meetings done in two weeks so I can get two or three weeks off. But again, I'm a district rep, and I'm the only guy that's involved in that. But uh, it doesn't make sense to have have it on a Friday of, of the last Friday, but I don't know. Councilor Jarvis. This is good fun. It's like musical chairs. Um, and I, I, I am understanding where um, our clerk is coming from with regards to getting staff reports ready for everything. But I mean, moving planning committee a, a day or two around during a week, I don't think is that should be that big of an issue for staff. And I'm finding myself in agreement with councillors Hazelton and Cooper in that we try and make this committee one in which the expertise that we have on it is best available. And if it means moving it to a Tuesday, Wednesday, or a Thursday within the week that it's already scheduled, I don't see that as a particular burden from a staff standpoint. Um, and wonder if we can't go out and get a, uh, you know, do a, a doodle, doodle poll or whatever it is with the committee members and find out what day is best. 
Okay. Historically, the meetings were on Fridays because when we met in person, then it was easier for the cottage members and the members who were traveling up from council, same as council meetings were kept on Mondays, Tuesdays, at the beginning of the week, committee of adjustment at the end of the week, that kind of thing. Yep. So if I move it into the middle of the month or the middle of the week, and then we do start having in-person council meetings, as we just discussed with the vaccination policy, we're now faced with the fact that councillors who are on that committee, who are perhaps cottagers, right, are now traveling back and forth midweek as opposed to the beginning and end of the week, which has been requested by staff previously. So if council would like to take that comment back from previous direction that's been given to staff and suggest another day, if like, because from what I'm understanding from this conversation, it sounds like council has an issue with the day. We've not received any issues from committee members not being able to attend. So if council would prefer to have meetings on Wednesdays, we can propose that as a date, but previous direction from members of council has always been to have meetings at the beginning and end of the week. So as, right. if that's changing, that's okay, but staff need to be aware of that so we can accommodate the schedules accordingly. All right, let's do it again. Councillor Hazlin, followed by Councillor Cooper. So I have a question, and perhaps this is aimed at our CAO. Um, our, uh, we've heard of the hybrid model from an employee standpoint. We've also heard that you are staffing up technologically to have basically hybrid uh, meetings, as I understand it, for Council and others. Um, would that also apply to a planning committee meeting? In other words, uh, would it be mandated to be an in-person meeting or uh, would Zoom meetings continue to be viable and possible? My guess is every member of the planning committee would prefer to be via Zoom, but um, uh, again, we've never polled them, so we have no idea what their, their date preferences are. But first, before we even think about going that path, we have to figure, we have to understand our um, hybrid meetings from a councillor perspective or a committee member perspective, are they uh, on the table and available as we progress forward? Ms. Gunby. Thanks to that. Through your worship, the, the hybrid meetings when they are able to be uh, fully implemented, and I'm not sure exactly when that will be, but we do hope that will involve all committees um, and all council meetings. And so members of the public who also don't want to drive to an in-person council meeting can take part at home. But if I can just get to the core of the issue here, um, is the planning committee the only one that council think needs to be polled on their availability? Because we set the dates for council meetings, committee of the whole, committee of adjustment, CAG. We set the dates for everything and the people will make themselves available if they want to be at that meeting. And contrary to what Councillor Jarvis said, it actually is a huge pain for staff not knowing when the meetings are, having to get reports ready, deadlines, things to be published, making sure staff is available. You have to have a clerk there. You have to have a representative from the department there. You have to have agendas out in a certain amount of time. Internally, having to set dates for the entire year instead of going out and polling once a month to then figure out and sort of lose your mind with all the paperwork and everything. It's very, it's much easier from a staff perspective to have it set for the entire year on the same date. You don't need everyone there. You can have quorum, that's fine. Uh, but I would think that if, if I'm on a committee in Severn Township, for instance, they don't ask me when I'm free. They tell me when the meetings are and if I can go, I go. And if I can't, I can't. Yeah, I, and thank you for that. I, I don't think anybody is suggesting that we uh, we poll on a monthly basis. I think what we're asking is, um, let's poll the planning committee, which we previously directed staff to do. Find out of the planning committee what the best date of the week is for them to meet and use that uh, kind of consensus, if you will, as a the recommended date. And if it's a Friday, great, because that fits your, what you've already laid out. If it's a some other date, in other words, if if we are going to, by definition, lose the majority of these high profile people um, in the planning committee uh, because we've selected Friday, then I think we need to know that up front. And we don't know that today. I this could be completely wasted airspace by me talking about this because everybody could meet Friday, but we haven't done the work. So we have no idea if people can meet on Friday. And I think it is, it's incumbent on us to uh, reach out and confirm availability. And I'm quite comfortable with Councillor Wianco's idea of, you know, if we can stick it in the week uh, for convenience for councillors, I'd say let's, let's try to, you know, um, 
uh, support counselor requests like that as well. Um, and I think we've, I, I think we've not done the the research, if you will, that we we need to do, so that we can uh, have have the appropriate structure and and uh, and date set up that uh, is needed. Thank you. I'm a little confused, and maybe Councilor Cooper will be able to handle it. I always thought, understood that planning committee in the past, with one or two exceptions, were on Fridays. Yes, they were and, always. And that, and that when the when uh, the members were appointed a number of years ago, uh, they understood it was Fridays. And I'm just wondering, Councillors Hazelton and Cooper, is there a particular member who's now complaining to you individually about Fridays? Councillor Cooper. Not particularly, except I see a councillor right beside me on the screen who has already said that he would prefer Councillor Wianco. So he has already expressed something right here today. And he suggested the week of the district, um, perhaps on the Friday. But I think all we're really suggesting here is that let's make sure that we can have the best attendance possible. And maybe we just need to say uh, the Friday of district week or the Monday of uh, the following week as an example and give the committee a chance to weigh in and give their availability. That's all. I don't, uh, I know that we set Friday uh, Mayor Kutz here, but I think uh, with respect to the, the caliber of the individuals that we have on this committee, including our councillors, that uh, it would be um, appropriate to canvas them. That's all I'm suggesting. Thank you. Councillor Jarvis. Yeah, I, I'm, I apologize for adding to the confusion uh, to our CAO, but I'm in agreement with the uh, thinking of Councillors Hazelton and Cooper in that once we set a date, it's the, that day of the week throughout the year. So we all, the only idea here is if Friday is not working, but Thursday works for everybody, then that's what we use. We use Thursday a week as opposed to the Friday. Um, we're going through a significant change in the way meetings are and are going to be held because of the pandemic. Um, and maybe it's more appropriate now to sort of rethink how we do our meetings. And this might be a good uh, first case scenario for us to see how it works and just make sure, as has been suggested, that the committee members that are part of the planning committee are comfortable with the Friday, or if there's a better day that works for all of them. Um, I mean, having said that, it may be that a couple of them have issues with it, but it turns out that Friday is the best day anyway, in which case, as Councillor Hazelton has suggested, this might be wasted airspace, but it's just... Um... Well, we've wasted airspace for 15 minutes on this matter. Okay, I'm done. I'm sorry. At a certain point, I'm just going to say, damn, survey the damn members. Who cares? We are talking over and over and over again on something that was set for years. We're, 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 I'm sorry, we're wasting our time. If Councilor Rianco wants it on district week, then let him try to persuade staff that put it on the third week every month and away we go. We're, we're wasting our time, folks. We really are. So if you want me to put an extra sentence into the resolution saying be it resolved that we approve the meeting calendar except for planning committee, I will do so if the majority want it. But let's move on. This is ridiculous. There, I have ranted. Good, a good idea, Mayor. Let's do that. Thank you. All right. Be it resolved that council, moved by Councillor Douglas, seconded by Councillor Hazel, be it resolved that council approves the 2022 meeting calendar as presented with the exception of planning committee. All those in favor? We're moving on. Thank you. All right, now we want to talk about parking on South Gibson Lake Road. Councillor Wienko, I believe this was your topic. <clears throat> do, I, do, I, do I dance talk right now? Um, there's a situation that's occurred in our area, <clears throat> and I'll go to some of the background. Of the, um, I know our bylaw enforcement officer is heavily involved, but I've been receiving calls at least three occasions, if not more, this past summer 
with uh, clubs, ATV clubs and these mud truck clubs outside of our township coming in to run our uh, uh, snowmobile trails, uh, the, the hydropower lines up behind us, and anywhere they can get their vehicles in to uh, tear up the, the wilderness. And in coming into our township, obviously they've got to park as close to some of these roads as possible. And uh, so what's happened up in uh, South Gibson Lake Road, the very end, there's a very large turnaround. And they've been clogging that area up when they come up. And of course, the neighbors are all upset because uh, there's a lot of noise associated with these, uh, these clubs. And of course, there's probably tailgate parties going on afterwards. And uh, so we can't really keep them out of our area. But what the, <clears throat> the bylaw enforcement group has done is that they put up no parking signs at the end of uh, South Gibson Lake Road 33. And that has stopped these people parking down there. And they just go and park about three kilometers further down the road and they clog up the Gibson Lake Landing, which is a parking lot for all the people on uh, Gibson Lake that uh, boat access. And they're of course very upset that all these mud trucks and so on are taking up their parking lot during a Saturday or Sunday. So the end result is that these no parking signs are at the end of uh, South Gibson Lake Road and people I'm being one of them, of course. Uh, I like to go down there and park our car and go for walks on uh, this number of trails back there. There's uh, um, the Five Winds, um, uh, out, what do they call themselves? Out back, whatever they call themselves. Um, they, they have trails back there, there's Skidoo trails, and there's a power line uh, road back there. So it's a great place to go for walks, but now I can't go there, and, and locals are complaining they can't go there for their, their Sunday or Saturday walks or whatever, because there's no parking signs down there. So in talking to uh, uh, the bylaw people, one idea came up that maybe we should put a, a no parking signs down there for, for vehicles with trailers because most of these mud trucks come in on big trailers. And I'm talking big, big trailers. So one of the mud trucks had one of these, you know, six foot high uh, tires. These are these uh, Russian machines. The tires are six feet tall and uh, the cab is in between the tires. And these things can go through mud holes and they can float on, on water and everything else. And they just tear up these, these trails. But anyway, uh, most of these uh, vehicles have trailers. So I'm saying, well, cars with trailers can't park down there, but other cars can park if they don't have a trailer. And that way it's a compromise um, for the locals that can go down there. But to put up signs to keep out the uh, external people to our township, it now it, it, it's a penalty on those people who actually live in the township and want to use those roads. Chief Van Dam, did you want to comment on this? Your Worship, uh, I'm. Uh, um, there's a number of issues that are arising out of this. So you have the local uh, people that are down there that are saying uh, we don't want these people parking down here, um, and trying to keep consistent with the bylaws that are already there and with enforcement. We have the issue. This is the exact issue that started off in McCray Lake and grew into a great big. Um, issue in the last couple of years, um, it's the same thing. We have a, a reserve, uh, the Gibson Lake Reserve that's down there that people are accessing now. Um, and I get that, that um, some of the locals uh, are getting it. We had that at McCray Lake that we had some local people at that point when we cut off uh, the parking on um, uh, Georgian Bay Road. So it's it's the same thing, and I I, I get I get Councillor Rienko's concerns. Um, it's trying to balance everything and stay consistent within the within the township um, and with the bylaw enforcement. Just coming out to say that you can't park a trailer there. Uh, I think we might have a legal challenge uh, with that one. I don't know if that can be done. I would have to do some legal review because a trailer becomes part of a car. Um, and we've had to deal with that with parking on Miners Bay 
before that we couldn't uh, tow things because of um, that that is part of the vehicle once it's hooked up. So there's some legal challenges that go along with that. So I'm just I don't have the solution offhand. I'm hoping that council, uh, we can work with you. Um, but I know that there is an issue down there with the ATVs. Um, they've been ripping up on the parkland, uh, on the baseball diamond. Um, so it, it's, it's not just one little issue. We just seem to be pushing the issue goes, once we clean up one area, it moves to another area. So. Uh, just keep that in mind as you're having your discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Wienko. I don't think there's any similarities between uh, this uh, turnaround area and uh, McCray Lake or Miners Bay because at those locations there are parking lots. Now they get overflowed and uh, at McCray Lake there is an overflow parking lot uh, further down the road. but. At this turnaround, at, at the end of 33, there is no parking. There is no parking. So you have to park, and then it's quite a large turnaround. And at any one time in the fall, when people are going for walks down there, there's never any more than two or three cars at the very most. So we're not looking at a huge uh, influx of people on the weekends. Every time I've been down there, at the, at, I've never seen more than one or two cars. So we're not talking about a, a, a major parking problem. Um, I agree that we got to keep the trailers out of there, but uh, to say because of this external group that comes in, all the locals then are, are get penalized for uh, something like that. So I, I don't know how we do it. Maybe uh, locals, maybe the locals can park there, and, and and people outside the township can't park there. I don't know, but you, you got to let the locals enjoy the walking trails that we have, and there's so few of them in our area. This is one excellent location to park your car and go for a two or three hour walk on some very decent trails. All right. I see Councillor Douglas's hand and we'll go to any, anybody else who wishes to comment. Oh, thank you. Um, so I'm, my, I'm just, I should probably know this, but is this a, this is a municipal road I take it? Yes, okay. So that's maybe that's a good suggestion which Councillor Wienko just brought up is maybe this there's some sort of bylaw that can be put in that this is something that says that this is a no, a tr no trailer zone or um, for local residents only. I don't, I don't really know, but I think that we should be able to do something because I don't know what the wording is and perhaps Chief Vandama can help us to um, put something together that will allow him to actually police it properly. Uh, but I do think it's a huge problem. I mean, it's, it's, this is just one of many areas. I mean, this one in particular, because there is no parking and because of what it's doing to, I mean, these ATVs and these big, I, I have nothing against people using, you know, the facilities we have at hand, but I don't even for people that want to walk on these trails, you can't, they wreck them so badly that, you know, so I would be in favor of, um, you know, Chief Van Dam, if you've got some suggestion on how you could police that uh, to come up with something, because I, I just, it's just a horrible thing that we're dealing with on that particular area for sure. But there are others um, dealing with the same, you know, ATV and these big trucks. So I reach out to you and, and hope you can come up with something for us that you can actually police. Chief, Chief Van Dam. So just to, for members of council, uh, just to give you as a heads up that right now, this is not a pressing issue uh, because in four days we, or next week, we have the parking restrictions for winter parking and there is no parking on the township roads period. So they'll all be getting tagged and towed at that point. However, we can, there is a, a, I'm going to say a possible solution. There needs to be some work done with it that we could create that. Uh, I'm going to say parking by permit only type of thing. However, that's going to need a bylaw amendment um, to go forward a council uh, to have that discussion. 
if if that is the avenue you want to go, then I strongly suggest that we may look at different areas of the municipality so that we try to clean it all up at the same same time because it is very frustrating for us to do this. I will also caution council that um, I know we're having budget restraints and all that, but if we keep adding areas that uh, we need to patrol and, and enforce, it's taking more time. Um, I know your worship, you're already well aware of that we've had some complaints back on Georgian Bay Road um, parking because they know we don't have the staff running around uh, on the weekends and that, and, and we try to adjust to it to catch people, but um, we're not lucky enough to do that all the time. So w when it comes to enforcement, it also comes with, with a cost to that. So everything we do, I, I would like to truly, that council understands if you want us to, to do this, this is going to be the cost that's associated with it. Um, especially in the times where we're trying to show dual diligence in, in our taxes and, and that kind of stuff. So if it's okay with council, give us some time to look at if it's council's direction. That's this is uh, this came to us by one councillor um, and it's got to be council's going to give the direction. Uh, so that, that's what I can offer you at this point. All right, thank you. I think we'll continue soliciting from Councillor. I saw Councillor Jarvis's hand. Um, yeah, actually, uh, uh, Chief Van Dam actually, uh, I think, dealt with it. It was uh, my concept. I, my thinking was, as with parking in Toronto and some of the uh, harder areas to park, it's by permit only. And uh, yeah, acknowledging that there is an enforcement cost and issue with that, but by permit only might uh help us out not only there but in a few other areas within the municipality so i i see that as a as a possible solution I, and, and, and if i may add to that i mean right now i have a parking pass hanging in my car issued by the township because that means that if i can go like the port severn lot i don't have to pay i think that parking pass could be expanded so if if if, if councillor wink or some of his neighbors have a parking pass from the township and they park at the end of uh, the road, um, then, you know, if signs say uh, no parking except with per permit, then he can go down and park there. Um, I also wonder, and, and this is just a, a quick aside, but if somebody's park, I mean, uh, Chief Undon made reference to the McRae Lake situation. Um, the McRae Lake situation very rarely included trailers. Most of those were hikers or canoeists. Um, I'm also wondering, can if, if somebody's parking a truck and a trailer, can you issue them two tickets, one for each vehicle? Because you should be able to, in my humble opinion, because they're taking up that much more space. With that, I'll go back to Councillor Douglas. I believe I saw her hand. Yeah, thank you. Good thought, though. Um, yeah, that's. I, I think that's probably a, a good idea to think about that. And you bring up some very valid points, Chief Van Dam, about uh, budgeting for staff and, and so on. But one thing that I would like council to think about, and I'm sure you probably already are, but in case this does not come to mind, when the time comes and this can actually be looked at or there's a budget for it, we should also be thinking about what the environmental impact has been in our bush and on these trails by these vehicles. So it's not, you know, it's not just a case of, you know, the community's upset because they can't park and they can't go in. But by controlling the entire township with the, the, this particular problem, boy, I don't know if any of you have ever walked through some of our trails in the bush. It, it's shocking what's happened in the last two years. I walk every single day in most of the area and I, it's, it's not even passable in some of the areas anymore. You have to bushwhack to get around the trail because there's so much damage done to um, those areas. So it's a, there, it's a much bigger problem, I think, for us. And if you control one, you might be able to save another with our environment, is what I'm, I'm thinking. Just wanted to point that out. Councillor Cooper. Paul, yeah, Councillor Cooper. Sorry, you, you moved your hand from one side of my screen to the other. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mayor Kutzier. And I just wanted to, I, I know that uh, Chief Van Dam was looking for direction from council and, and I'd be very, uh, interested in having him come back. I'm 
with some of these concepts and whether they work or not. So you were looking for direction and that's sort of where I would be on this. And uh, thank you for, if you take the time to look at it, thanks. All right. Um, the, the, what I have in front of me is moved by Councillor Wienko, seconded by Councillor Douglas. Be it resolved that council direct staff to review the parking parameters at South Gibson Lake Road Trailhead and the council supports permitted parking of residents with singular vehicle without a trailer on South Gibson Lake Road. I, mean, I, I think, I'm not sure that's exactly what we want for the second sentence. Councillor Wienko. No, I like the idea um, that you mentioned, uh, Mr. Mayor, about the idea of expanding our present permits uh, uh, to include a number of, of locations besides uh, the Port 7 Park. That might be a solution. It might be a fairly straightforward solution um, that these, par these passes are good at other locations in the township. The only issue I have there is that um, this um, organization that want to come in and clean their trails five winds backcountry ski club um they're obviously external to our township but they're coming in for a good purpose they're coming in to clean the trails so the locals can walk on the trails and so on so they're here to do good so they they, they maybe have to be an exception for some people that can make a, a special application to apply for a permit so they can come in and do their good work um, uh, we ran into a situation a while ago, a couple of years ago, when some of our residents on Six Mile Lake were in cleaning uh, up a campsites over on Bear Lake. And while they were in, they got a parking ticket and uh, because there were no parking area, but they were in doing good work. They were cleaning up uh, campsites and so on. So there may be a need for special exemptions to uh, a, a, a local township pass that people coming into the township to do good can get an exemption. All right, but I mean, at this point, Councilor Wienko, are you satisfied with us giving direction as opposed to passing a specific resolution? Yes, yes, as long okay. as there's, there's a solution that works uh, for both um, the locals and those worthy of having it uh, from outside, yes, I am. Right, thank you. Any other comments from other councillors? All right, Chief Undum, um, as you say, you, uh, in four days, you can enforce no parking anywhere you want to almost, um, if, if you want to, but uh, I think this is something to look at over the next couple of months to see. Um, and, and I think, I think Councillor Douglas brought up a very important point is that uh, we want to protect against overuse. I mean, that's one of the things that happened at McRae Lake, even though they was not machinery in most cases, the trails were being overused. Um, and uh, so I think we have to, um, un sadly, we have to enforce respect for our, uh, the wilderness around us. Okay. Chief Undum, you want to make a couple more remarks? Your Worship, just a couple things to, to make sure Council's well aware of. Uh, it's probably going to take a bylaw amendment that we're going to move forward with this. Uh, we will look at the permit uh, issue because I believe that will be the most legal thing um, and easiest to enforce and, and, and uh, we'll have to go to um, the courts to get the fines approved and stuff like that. So it's a fair amount of work that's going to be required. What I do want council to know is that I'm almost sure, but I, we will do some of that research too, is the trailers, once they're hooked on a vehicle is a legally part of that vehicle. And we may not be able to distinguish between trailers uh, as that as such, but we'll do a bit of a legal review with uh, our prosecutor and we'll find that out for sure. Wouldn't it be great if you could find by the foot that <laughs> illegal parking is $10 per foot? We may be able to add, pay for a bylaw officer then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, Chief Anam, we appreciate it. And I think that I think we've been clear in our direction that uh, unfortunately we want a little more control on the parking on our uh, township roads. Thank you. Councillor Cooper, the William Grenville Davis Center for the Great Lakes. 
a feasibility study. Thank you, Mayor Kutzier. And, and uh, you will recall, I think it was in September, we passed a resolution uh, to support um, not only a letter going to the Premier, but uh, to have an examination of uh, the feasibility of an education centre in Honey Harbour. And uh, so this is sort of the next step, I guess, essentially uh, confirming what we more or less discussed at the last uh, time we had this matter in front of us. Um, the, the, the cost of doing this is about $15,000 with HST and the district uh, and Chair Klink are going to be discussing this at the next council meeting, which I'm pretty hopeful that they'll approve. So it was essentially uh, trying to sort of uh, make it a relatively low cost for both our township and the district to at least look at a at, look at this from a feasibility perspective, and uh, and then there would be other steps after that if in fact the feasibility study um, you know came forward with with something that made some sense to all of us. So it's really just a a, a basic first step, and the person that uh, we've identified. Uh, to do the work would be a Dr. Linda Vranick, who has examined this uh, for us before her. So um, I think it, it, we've got somebody in place that is very well suited to uh, do the feas feasibility study, who understands where funding can come from federally, provincially, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think we've got the right player, somebody that was identified for us uh, through the Ontario Centers of Excellence. So. Um, I don't know whether there are any questions uh, for me about this, but I'm, I'm just trying to sort of move this along um, and make sure that we give it careful consideration and, and go from there. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you very much. Does anybody from staff wish to comment on this before I turn it over to council? Council, anybody wish to make any comments? Councilor Rienko. I think it's just a little, little, little bit more about what you mean by feasibility study. Um, like obviously you're looking for a location, the potential for a location of some kind of a school, I assume in the Honey Harbor area, maybe it's Port 7, I don't know. Maybe you mean more specifics, if, if, if it's in the Honey Harbor area, are we talking about the Delawana property or do you have other properties in mind? I'm just you know saying a feasibility study and not saying what parameters are in that feasibility study. I'm just, I just need some clarity on that. Mayor Kutzier, may I answer that? Please. <laughs> um, and a and very good question. And, and I think, um, you know, um, I've been asked by our CAO and our clerk to not identify a specific property uh, due to other issues, but uh, suffice to say that um, five, five, six years ago, when I first started down this road, uh, there was a commitment uh, for some specific property in the Honey Harbor area. And uh, more recently, um, going back to late August, I uh, had discussions about the same piece of property. So there is an identifiable um, location, and th that's also part of what the feasibility study uh, would look at, but uh, I think there's, uh, you know, if, if we don't have the right property, we won't have the education center. So in, in a sense, um, we're not talking about um, a, a program where we have to go out and buy property and build an education center. We're talking raising funds uh, through federal and provincial uh, areas, uh, um, raising funds, uh, for the building itself, and and it would be the idea would be to have it as uh, self-funding. In other words, um, essentially the rents and revenues generated would pay for the operation of the the buildings. So that's it's really to raise the money for the buildings and to have a piece of land that's donated. So I, I think so we are considering the Honey Harbor community area for this, something that is, has road access and water access would be ideal. Um, exactly. The feasibility study might include property recommendations. 
Exactly. And I'm sorry. Yes, it, it does have to do with waterfront for sure, because it's, you know, it is a going to be an education center. One of the main features would be to study the environment. And uh, so we'd need uh, not only water access, but vessels to go out and do these studies. And we already have organizations doing work on Georgian Bay. So uh, they may be come part of this whole piece. In fact, I've had discussions with some of the various organizations on Georgian Bay, if they'd have an interest in being part of this whole process. And um, I've had some strong um, indications from organizations as, such as SSEA, for example, a, a real interest in, in this. So I had that discussion recently, uh, Council Rianco, and I thought uh, you may or may not be aware of that, but in any event, I was just uh, trying to sort of cast about speaking to potential, shall we say, tenants and uh, we have universities that have expressed interest. So it, it's not uh, just a shot in the dark. There's been a lot of uh, groundwork done, but now we need somebody to come in and say, this makes a lot of sense or doesn't make any sense. Does that help? Yes, I think it does. Any other comments? Com uh, Councilor Rainfield. Just, just to follow up, you said the Honey Harbor community, but you know what's 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 the problem is over by Midland or something like that over along the shoreline of of uh, uh, Wabashim or something like in the, uh, over there. Like why necessarily Honey Harbor? I don't think uh, William Davis would be upset that it was not in Honey Harbor, but I don't know. I, I would hate to say that if you couldn't do it in Honey Harbor, therefore it's a dead issue. Um, there's a lot of shoreline uh, in Seven Sound, oh, and, and that's maybe the it could whole be a point. water access college. That's the whole point of the feasibility study. I mean, at the physical study, said there's a no-go. The township shouldn't be sponsoring a, a feasibility study for Midland. If I could just address that also, if I may, Mayor, uh, in, in that I've had some discussion uh, with SSEA, and there are other organizations that are interested in perhaps having a, uh, something somewhere else and and they're welcome to go after it. We're, we're looking at um, the eastern shores of Georgian Bay, uh, particularly uh, access, uh, Port Severn, uh, sorry, uh, Honey Harbor has access to uh, the eastern coastal areas of Georgian Bay from Honey Harbor up to Manitoulin Island. So th there's, there's an interest in being in uh, that particular part of the bay. And, and I think it also ties in rather well with, with uh, former Premier Davis in that uh, a seasonal resident in the area, former education minister, um, established the first environmental um, ministry in, in North America. Uh, so there's a lot of very, very uh, specific ties to, to the Honey Harbor area that would make some sense for this. And uh, that was also part of a report that I I um, I don't know whether you've seen the PowerPoint that was put together about this, but uh, if you haven't, I have sent it in a few times, and uh, that uh, may help explain some of this, but hope that helps. Thank you. Councillor Hazelton, I believe I saw your hand at one point. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, just want to draw a couple of uh, parallels here. Um, I think everyone understands that when you have a shopping mall, a plaza, whatever, uh, you need an anchor uh, tenant to uh, basically command the growth and the, uh, the sustainability of that mall. Um, we in Honey Harbor, in the hamlet of Honey Harbor, lost our anchor tenant, which was essentially driving the commercial viability of the hamlet of Honey Harbor. And uh, I think what uh, Councillor Cooper has come up with here is an idea that uh, with a little bit of vetting may end up uh, providing another anchor tenant in the hamlet that could drive uh, the growth of the hamlet and uh, cause some you know thriving of commercial activity in the hamlet and so uh, I, I think with from my perspective um, that that is is really key um, we have uh, we have been struggling in the hamlet to uh, to, to find some way of, of having this anchor tenant, if you will, or this, uh, this uh, anchor uh, um, business establishment that will drive the su success of this, these other uh, business organizations. And I think this is an opportunity to flush out the viability of it. And uh, I absolutely support this idea as a path uh, to 
understand if if we can make this thing uh, um, be a significant change uh, for our uh, community. Thank you. Councillor Douglas. Yeah, I'm, I'm in agreement with uh, Council Hazelton and Councillor Cooper on this one. Uh, you know, with the waterfront development in Honey Harbor and the uh, the location, you know, possibilities of what that could bring to that particular hamlet, um, I, I, I do agree that this study would, would sort of solidify whether, you know, this is the right place to look and, and other uh, aspects of, you know, whatever this report is going to bring back to us. Um, the idea is great. Bill Davis was a huge part of this community and our politics and uh, I think this is uh, something that we should seriously consider being a, a, a good thing to happen. So I support you. Okay, what I have in front of me reads, moved by Councillor Cooper, second by Councillor Hazelton, whereas the Council of the Township of Georgian Bay approved resolution C255-2021 regarding the William Renville Davis Education Center for the Great Lakes. And whereas per resolution C255-2021, council agreed to contribute towards the initial feasibility study. Now, therefore, council approves the initial feasibility study expenditure in the amount of $7,500 plus HST to be paid from the working capital reserve. All those in favor. And that is carried unanimously. Thank you. Mayor, could I just say one quick thing? Okay, one Thank quick you. thing. Thank you, <laughs> and and I'm glad we didn't insert your name in that blank there, uh, the, uh, supported but paid for by the mayor. <laughs> well, that, that, I, I presume that to be a later fundraising effort. <laughs> exactly, thank you. Um, okay, we are now, uh, what do we have here? Here's on. We have, do we have any bylaws that um, Ms. Way wants us to pass? Your Worship, we have to um, officially receive 10C resolution in open session, please. There is a resolution for okay, it. Okay, yes. Um, this is a resolution that was made in, um, in, clo in closed, I think I have the right one here, in closed last month. But for legal reasons, uh, it needs to be read publicly. Um, and now I just want to make sure I have the right resolution in front of me. I, I'm sorry, I just missed right over. I, I, I skipped right over that and I apologize to everybody. So it is what I have, the, the motion I have in front of me simply reads, be it resolved that council, this is moved by Councilor Jarvis, second by Councilor Rianco, be it resolved that council receives in public council resolution CS31-2021 from the October 12th, 2021 council meeting. Um, I don't know if I have that one in front of me here. Are you looking for the close? Yeah. Did I, which page is that on or did, did it's It's part of the agenda package, your worship. Okay. That's why you, yeah. I okay. So all of this resolution is just okay, that one right. sentence. I will read this. This is on page 101 of our agenda package. And I apologize to everybody for my confusion. This was from October 12th, 2021 was originally passed in closed session. So it, at that point it was moved by Councillor Jarvis, seconded by Councillor Bocek at that time. Whereas council has reviewed repair order E20-21, the repair order for lands known municipality as, municipally as 109 Ravine Way, the subject property, issued August 24, 2021, pursuant to section 7.2 of the Township of Georgian Bay Township, bylaw number 2014, Dash 72, the township site alteration bylaw and received the presentation of the township bylaw enforcement officer with respect to the repair order. And whereas council has reviewed the submissions with respect to the repair order provided on behalf of Paul and Roberta Lynn Henhofer, owners of the subject, the owners, 
and heard the oral submissions presented on behalf of the owners at the hearing of the review. Now, therefore, be it resolved that Council Repair Order E20-2021 is hereby altered to correct the typographical error in item C by replacing the phrase top cell 750 millimeters to top cell 75 millimeters and otherwise is confirmed in its entirety. I trust council re recalls this from last month and that was carried in closed. And the resolution I have now was moved by Councillor Jarvis, seconded by Councillor Wienko. Be it resolved that Council receives in public Council Resolution CS 31 2021 from the October 12th, 2021 Council meeting. All those in favor. And that is carried. Thank you. Okay. And so now. We, we can skip the closed part because we've postponed item 12 in our agenda closed until um, tomorrow. And therefore, I now have a confirming bylaw on some page here. And as be it resolved that this is moved by Councilor Douglas, Douglas, seconded by Councilor Jarvis, be it resolved that Council adopts bylaw 2021-070 to confirm the proceedings of the November 8th, 2021 Council meeting. All those in favor. And that is carried. And I now have, be it moved by Councillor Cooper, second by Councillor Wienko, be it resolved that Council does now adjourn at 12.24 p.m. until December 13th, 2021 at 9 a.m. or at the call of the chair. All those in favor. And that is carried, which means we're now adjourned. Thank you very much. And we can enjoy the, the nice weather this afternoon, wherever you may be.